Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 79 of Through the Years, the podcast that reviews Ring of Honor, show by show, from the beginning. My name is Trevor Dame. The other voice you will hear, as always, is Matt Feuerstein. Matt, we're back. I think we took three weeks off, which used to be the norm, but, you know, we after we went so hard in the summer, and of course, hard for us is bi-weekly, which for most people, you know, most people do a weekly podcast. We don't, but it did, I felt my memory was already starting to go with, with the three of us. I was like, how do I open this show again? What number is this episode? Like, it's funny how you get used to things very quickly. This is, you said this was episode 80, right? 79. 79. Oh, man. So we're like very close to 80, which is how I feel in my body almost all the time. So it's perfect, actually. Hopefully there'll be one aspect of my life where I'll be able to make it to 80, and that'll be this podcast because I don't think I don't think that I'll make it to 80 in any other way. So, Well, fun fact, the day that uh, through the years turns 80 episodes is the same day that United States President Joe Biden turns 79 years old. So we're 79, he's 79, uh, we're, we're all 79, and we're – never mind. This is the podcast that is definitely 79 at heart. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's so, just it's just true. Um, and as always, the little bit of housekeeping we do before the show gets – before the fun gets going, Matt, and as always, we will have some fun. There will be some laughs. There will be some chuckles. Some good times will be had. But as always, the only thing we ever plug on through the years is the way you can get to the show. And there are three feeds. You've obviously found one of them. You can go to us through the Pro Wrestling Only feed, which is us with a bunch of other great wrestling podcasts, past and present. I am doing – in fact, I've been digging through the old Pro Wrestling Only podcast this week for some research or something unrelated to this podcast that I'm doing. And you know, it's always fun to revisit the old stuff. And of course, there's still some great current podcasts, like uh, even covering current wrestling, like Boom Goes the Dynamite, which I – which, believe it or not, might be covering AEW Dynamite. And uh, we also have our own feed through the years, just T-H-R-O-H. That's if you just want us and want an easy-to-access, complete archive of every show we've done, which is now 79 episodes. And then it continues to grow, Matt. It, it, it shocks me, but, you know, we've reached a new milestone. I think one of the last one or two episodes I mentioned, we had the milestone of getting our first Twitter, I mean, YouTube comment, and it was negative. We've now gotten two or three positive YouTube comments because every episode of the show is on YouTube and more people watch every, every time we come back here, more people are watching. And now even someone referenced deep said they're a deep vein thrombozo. We see your comments. We appreciate them. And, uh, yeah, I don't understand why people want to listen to podcasts on YouTube, but I appreciate it. Yeah, um, I think it's just there's something real satisfying about, you know, seeing that little thumbnail the entire time that you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> I love thumbnails. I got two of them. Um, and so that brings us to the news that happened between the last Ring of Honor show and this show. First one is just a very minor story. But uh, this is from the PW Insider at the time that was talking about Ring of Honor. Mike Johnson writes, there are plans to use the former Spike Dudley, Matt Heisen, but the way his schedule is working out, he likely wouldn't debut until early 2006. So, Matt, on recent shows, I've talked about, oh, like there was rumors like in The Observer that like, oh, Ring of Honor would be interested in Spike Dudley. And we were like, well, was that true? Because it never happened. Well, I I didn't realize this. There was actually a more concrete story where it wasn't just, oh, they're interested. It was basically like, oh, they're they're going to use him. And yeah, I don't know if it just because of TNA he decided he didn't want to do it anymore or what. Um, Because I think there was word that he was also looking for a high price on the indies. Who knows? But yeah, I guess – it's it's interesting. We talked about this before with Spike Dudley because this story's been kind of little drips through the last few episodes. But it is interesting to think about where Spike Dudley would have fit in 2006 Ring of Honor. Has there ever been a match where Spike Dudley was like working like you know a technical style just to show everybody he could do it? Because I guess that's probably what he would have done in ROH at least a little bit, right? But I don't know if I've ever seen that match if it exists. I'm not sure. I, yeah, that'd be. I mean, Spike Dudley was a good wrestler, but but he never did like the mat wrestling stuff. It was no. more like the big, like, no, no, you know, no. the big bumps and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, next, we have from the PW Torch. 
Austin Aries wrote on his website that he is close to signing with TNA. Quote, I can confirm reports that I have received a contract offer from TNA. I'm finalizing some wording in the contract and will officially sign it early next week, Aries wrote. I'm excited about the potential of TNA and glad I'm going to be part of it. He will continue working for Ring of Honor full time also. So, yeah, this is another thing we've talked about in recent episodes where TNA was officially in, like, if you can't beat Ring of Honor, just copy them. In fact, I think when I was just researching this just before the show, they actually said, like, there was a brief time shortly after this in TNA where Austin Aries, Alex Shelley, and Roderick Strong were a stable in TNA. And, like, someone even referenced, oh, like, they're the second coming of Generation Next. It's like they were just outright, like, lifting the stable even for uh, TNA at some point. Although TNA did a lot more comedy with these guys. Like, do you remember the, um, the paparazzi challenge series that they started doing those little funny videos with Kevin Nash? Like, pretty much is pretty much right away after this, like in the, in the couple months after this, they were, and that, that featured Aries and Shelly and Jay Lethal and Loki and, or I guess was he already Senshi at that point? Um, and who could forget the repackaging of Austin Star? Yeah, Austin Star. Do you remember those videos, the the PCS videos? Yeah, because uh, I remember like I used to listen in the old days, like the early days of the famous uh, Brian and Vinny show on F4W Online, and they loved to play like the Kevin Nash clips from those, like where he goes like LOL, like and stuff like that. And I th- I've I've actually good. watched some of them in the past year or so. You know, they're they're not bad. They're they're kind of funny. I mean, Kevin Nash was funny. It's like some, the problem was sometimes he was funny and kind of dismissive when it wasn't time to be, but like when it was appropriate, you could really appreciate like, oh, he's just like a very charismatic, funny guy. Just like nowadays, like you can appreciate Kevin Nash because when he's being kind of funny and snarky to people, it's like he's on the side of the angels and not on the side of being a disinterested millionaire, like ruining a wrestling company. Yeah. And and Alex Shelley had good chemistry with him in those little clips. Yeah, definitely. And Alex Shelley, I feel like, was always a guy who never was utilized to his full potential. But I felt like that was the time when he got where you felt like he was closest to maybe breaking through because you thought like even though it was more of putting him in a more of a comedy light, it was like he was actually getting, you know, to show off his charisma. He was getting to interact in a fun way with like a major name from wrestling. But that in some ways, that was kind of like the most prominent role he would have, I think, sadly. Yep. But uh, that brings us to a uh, similar story that was going on with Homicide. And Matt, this story goes some places. <laughs> Holy shit. I, I, the wording of some of this is just – okay, I'll just read it. It's from the Observer's TNA section. So this was uh, – at this time, again, TNA was now even going after Homicide at this point. Uh, Dave wrote, Homicide hasn't signed a deal with TNA yet, nor been given an official offer yet although he's been talked about for down the road. His legal situation that didn't allow him to leave the state and work the Ted Petty Invitational this past weekend is that something happened to Dan Moth. Actually, we've heard a lot has happened to him, but he's still alive, and anything else nobody wants to talk about. Um, Moth completely disappeared from pro wrestling regarding something to do with homicide. It has also never become clear other than it was for Moth's own safety, and he crossed homicide in some sort of a deeply personal way. Homicide has not been charged with anything related to what recently happened to Moth, but he was told not to leave New York City. Because he's got a family and wrestling is his job, he was able to plead his case and be allowed to leave the city for work purposes. Homicide has said everything as far as travel will be cleared up this week, and he's going to be on the Ring of Honor show on October 2nd in Philadelphia, but the timing of this could make TNA hold up on making him an offer. Matt, again, I just got to re re Pete, the wording of that one line. I love that this was a story that people would just like mention this at the time, like, and then they would just kind of leave it at that, like, eh, no need to look into this further. So let's just reread that line again. Um, about something happened to Dan Moff. Quote: Actually, we've been, we've heard a lot has happened to him, but he's still alive. And anything else, nobody wants to talk about. Like, what the fuck? So, so none of the details of this ever really became public, right? In the many years since, right? No, I mean, we've talked, uh, you know, when it happened earlier in the year, go back and find out. So we, I think in the interest of not being like a rumor monger and not potentially getting sued, not that I think anyone would sue us, but we try to be careful on that. We, we just basically said, I think like 
there are rumors out there. If you Google homicide Dan, Dan Moff, you can find the rumors for yourself. I but but but, but the rumors are still like no different than they would have been if you looked 15, 16 years ago, right? Like nothing new yeah. has come out. That's interesting. It makes me wonder if all of this was way overblown in the first place. I mean, obviously he did leave wrestling for a while, so obviously there was something major happened. But like this stuff, like about like he's still alive, like but we but with but something bad happened to him, like. I don't know. It just makes me wonder, like, was it really as serious as they said? Well, also, Matt, uh, Dan Moff was signed in the last couple, two or three years with Ring of Honor. Right. And then he got released during speaking out kind of very quietly. And so, right. Well, yeah. But, I mean, but, that, but is, that, is that connected to this particular incident? Well, maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Well, again, we have no idea. But I will say, if you believe the rumors, that's the kind of thing I think that when a company would be doing speaking out related – investigations that might be the kind of thing where if it was if they were able to confirm it would probably be a reason during that period when people were taking a more serious look and taking that more that stuff more as a serious matter like right, right. probably we all should have been always when i when i said overblown i more meant like what homicide's role in the whole thing and like what he was up to you know rather than and anything that moff did did or didn't do you know well it's funny because like i mean there was a lot of these newsletters saying that you know you know, Moff can't be anywhere near homicide for his safety. And Moff did stop wrestling completely for a while. But yeah, like we talked about in that in that other episode, if you look at Cage Match, like years and years later, Moff and Homicide did eventually like work in the same match together multiple times. So whatever happened between them, they obviously reached some kind of of slight peace that would allow them to be co-workers rather than a guy that if you read these kind of stories would make you think that he was in legit danger for his life, perhaps. Right. Um, crazy though. It, it's crazy to think that like, I feel like if, if that kind of story broke today, you wouldn't be able to just write that line and kind of leave that back. Cause I think if you said something that severe, there'd be kind of a expectation that you dig a little deeper. Like, well, so it, I mean, it really is. I mean, it, it, it puts homicide like in a very negative light. Like, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. th th this is a guy who's been around in wrestling for this entire time. People are happy to work with him. And like these stories make him out to be the, like the world's most dangerous man, not, you know, no offense to Ken Shamrock. So like, <laughs> I, um, so, you know, so that's why I say maybe overblown, like, I mean, homicide, as far as I can tell, has never been in like the degree of legal trouble in his wrestling career that these sort of stories would suggest he would get it. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, did he used to talk? I mean, I assume it was informed by real life that that he had parole issues, and right? But like, if you're talking about like the sort of stuff where like he's in danger for his life, you you know the guy, you know what I mean? Like it, that would have been, it would have been more than that. Yeah, yeah, I, I have no clue, but. Uh... Finally, one last news story, and it kind of pays off the last two stories. Again, we go to The Observer. Ring of Honor is going to change again and with more traditional heel versus face angles with old school heel stuff because Sapolsky's mind on what he does is in many ways a product of listening to Paul Heyman at 3 a.m. Heyman's belief was always that small promotions have to do something entirely different from the big ones. You can argue that. But to have your own identity, that's true, because a small guy becomes a second-rate guy if he's offering the same product as the promotion with national television, even if he came up and established the concepts first. Witness the last couple years of ECW after WWF and WCW copied their stuff. With TNA clearly emphasizing similar concepts and in many ways redoing what worked for in Ring of Honor on a much larger stage, Ring of Honor is likely in some form to change. Danielson as champion is planned to work longer and less spot-oriented matches because the big TNA matches are the fast-paced, big move variety, and the WWE matches are more masses-oriented with an easier-to-understand and less technical style. So it is interesting in the sense of, I thought, you know, like Danielson's matches were just the kind of matches Danielson like to work and i i think there's still probably a big dose of that in here but it is interesting that it's kind of framed here as also like a conscious decision to basically try and stand out and basically feel like oh if tna is going to kind of eat our lunch a bit then we've got to we've got to change away from that yeah although i don't think like ROH had been doing that, you know, like their like yeah. their their world title matches had been long and they hadn't been super like spot oriented the way like you watch a TNA match with Samoa Joe and you watch an ROH match with Samoa Joe and you know, at least up by two thousand four they would have been pretty different. You know what I mean? Like Joe's two thousand four ROH matches, I should say, 
would have been pretty different from his 2005 TNA matches. Like it's not something that's like that's something that started in late 2005. So I'm sure that is true, you know, and you could see that the style has was getting a little bit more deliberate and, you know, even you might even argue basic in some ways. Um, so, but I don't think it's so dramatic of a change from what they were doing before. Yeah. And, and it's also interesting in the way, like, it's probably a little overstated this idea that, oh, TNA, you know, is do, I mean, yes, they were signing up obviously from the stories we just talked about ring of honor talent and, you know, in some ways kind of co-opting them a little bit, but like, well, sometimes the X division would be featured up top and get a real good spotlight on it. A lot of times, you know, it was still kind of an undercard. You've got eight minutes, go do a bunch of crazy spots where I feel like ring of honor, even if they were still sticking just to the same style and sharing a lot of the same talent, I still feel like a lot of those guys, you would get to see them with less restrictions in terms of time and, and everything else in a ring of honor than a TNA. Like I would rather see an Austin Aries match generally in, in ring of honor than I would at this point in TNA, even though he probably had some good ones. Well, I know he did in in TNA. Right. But the AJ styles of the world, you might prefer seeing him in TNA. Yeah. And, uh, that brings us to survival of the fittest 2005, which took place September 24th, 2005 at the National Guard Armory in Dorchester, Massachusetts, in front of a reported crowd of 425 fans, which um, Ring of Honor must not have been happy with, Matt, because this is the last show Ring of Honor ran in the Boston area for over 13 months. So we will not be covering a Ring of Honor show in Massachusetts for a very long time on this podcast. Yeah, Joe Gagne, we have to switch to Connecticut for your uh, for your shows. <laughs> It's all Joe's fault. Although I, I want, I want, I so desperately want to make it's all Joe. Uh, it's all Joe's fault. Joke, but he wasn't on this show, so you could say it's all Joe's credit that they were ever in Boston. No, 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 no. You can frame it this way: it's all Joe's fault for not going. Yes, he was the str- If it was four hundred twenty-six fans, they still they would never have stopped running here. Exactly. Yeah, he, he Joe, you fucked it up again. Anyway, there you go. Joe. See, um, <laughs> gave you what you so, wanted. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Matt. Uh, we open with Austin Aries and Roderick Strong backstage. Aries says it's been a whole year since his breakout performance in the last Survival of the Fittest tournament. He came up a little short, though, that year, and he doesn't like that. He aims to win it all this year. Uh, Roderick says, sorry, Austin, but this is his turn, and Survival of the Fittest is his chance to prove that his win over Matt Hardy wasn't a fluke and that he is what people say he is, which is the future of this business. So just, you know, um foreshadowing the story at the very end of the night. And- I, I, I like this, like the story they're telling. I did think it was amusing how like low energy this promo was. Like, uh, you know, Aries is talking about, you know, I, I you know, want to make good for losing last year, even though this put me on the map. And then Strong's just like, hey, you know, sorry, man. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to win, actually. And Aries is just like, yeah, all right. <laughs> like, he's just like, okay, <laughs> that's fine. You know, and they just kind of walk away. Like, it's just like, it's just so low key that it's, uh, no pun intended, but I find it <laughs> fairly amusing. Well, it's like, cause I appreciate that they did not try to turn this into like a tension angle, which we can talk about at the end or anything like, like they didn't try and seize like dissension or they're going to hate each other over this. But it's funny cause when you think about that, then how do you sell a, a promo like this? Because if you're not doing like the tension or the anger or anything, you kind of do have to be almost blase, like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, me. I guess I'll be okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there was ne- necessarily anything wrong with it. I just found it amusing because it's so unlike pro wrestling, you know? Yeah, 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 definitely. And uh, as always, there were a couple uh, dark matches that we do not see that were happened before the rest of the main card. There was a six man tag with Hale Collins, a local Northeast indie wrestler who is, I believe, still wrestling to this day, teaming with Shane Hagedorn and Smash Bradley. And they beat Anthony Franco, Bobby Dempsey, and Matt Turner. And then a dark match, Jason Blade, who we will see in a little backstage segment soon enough, uh, defeated Davey Andrews. So that was your two dark matches. And that brings us to the opener, a first-round match in the Survival of the Fittest 2005. Jay Lethal defeated Sal Renaro via pinfall in 11 minutes, 34 seconds after hitting the Dragon Suplex. So I guess just in case, for some reason, you don't know what the Survival of the Fittest tournament was, uh, it was a it was a two round tournament basically. It was six singles matches usually, although sometimes they would do a tag match in the place of one of them. And then the six winners 
move on to the main event of the night, which is a six-man elimination match. And the winner of that is the Survival of the Fittest. There is no trophy. There is no guaranteed title shot, although generally guys that won these things would quickly move on to a title shot. It's just a very kind of simple one-night, two-round tournament. And interesting enough, a lot of the, there's a, a few different regulars in Ring of Honor or semi regulars at this point that did not work this show because of a different pro wrestling tournament, which would be the TPI, the Ted Petty Invitational, the show that Homicide apparently couldn't go to because people told him not to leave New York. Um, I think James Gibson worked night one of it the day before and then got eliminated on the first night so he could come here. Um, like Matt Seidel, Delirious were working that show. Uh, obviously Brian Danielson did when, and that's why he missed this, uh, show. But, uh, Matt, this was the first match of the tournament. What'd you think about it? I found this pleasantly surprising. Like I, 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 you know, a lot of times these ROH openers, when you have a guy who's sort of like new or not really been pushed, you know, the crowd can be kind of flat for it and, you know, it's just very basic. And, you know, there was some basic aspects of this match, but they both guys were very high energy. Um, they were very motivated and the crowd really appreciated it. Like, they, you know, they, they didn't do anything so crazy or amazing and it wasn't like some amazing match, but it was just – it moved real fast and it was fun and they did some cool moves. Like, Renaro, you could tell, was really motivated to make a good impression and I thought that he did for the most part. He, you know, he does a pretty cool thing where he like flips over Lethal to bring him over in this like – almost like a modified arm drag. It's hard to explain, but I thought it was really cool. Um, you know, and they, they, they do some basic stuff, which Lethal stops with a, you know, big time spine buster pretty early. Um, and Lethal's, you know, I, one thing that I noticed about Lethal during this era that I didn't remember, he chops really, really hard, like, or yeah. really, really loud at least. And like, I'm always impressed by his chops during this period. Just like, I, I didn't remember that. You know, I remembered Roderick Strong with the chops, but not so much Lethal, but his chops are loud. Um, but, um, you know, like there's, there's one part, part uh, point where Lethal pulls himself up in the corner, almost like skinning the cat, but, um, but kicks, uh, kicks Lethal on the way up, which I thought was nice. Um, then Lethal stops Renaro on the top rope and teases doing something, which, uh, Sal reverses into a top rope bulldog and both guys are down. Um, there's one point where Lethal does a hip toss into a backbreaker, which I thought was pretty cool. Um. Sal hits a big tornado DDT off the ropes for two, and the crowd just going nuts at this point, which, you know, like, they're really getting into this. Um, Lethal gets the top rope headbutt and gets a two count, and then they try something, and Renaro hits, like, a really sloppy stunner, which I thought hurt the momentum, which I thought was building pretty well at that point. Um, but then Renaro goes for a springboard spin kick, and Lethal moves and hits the dragon suplex and gets the win. Um, until that like kind of weird mess up botch thing near the end, I uh, I thought it was going along pretty swimmingly, and I still overall thought it was a pretty entertaining opener. And I think it was more than I thought it would be when I like saw the beginning of the match. Uh, I, I probably was a little less high on this than you. I thought it was a decent opener, but this was kind of exactly what I thought it would be. Just a, a decent opener, you know, not a ton of story or anything or emotion to it, obviously. It was just kind of a thrown-together match. Uh, he, we got to see Lethal be kind of in control and the veteran of a match, which is, again, it's always interesting when you see guys start to get roles that they didn't normally have. We'll see another example of that on the show. and. You know, he controls the first half and works over Sal's back. You went over pretty much all of my highlights in this match. I really liked, uh, like you mentioned, that, that skin the cat kick uh, Sal did, I think was really cool. I like how it transitioned into him landing into like sitting on the top turnbuckle and then lethal throwing a drop kick from the ring that caught him on the top. Turn. I thought that was a very, really cool sequence. And I agree also that like, you know, it was one of those crowds that what maybe wasn't as big as Ring of Fire want, but I thought they were like decent, like a little bit better than I expected for reactions, especially on matches like this, where I was like, wow, yeah, the crowd's pretty into this. Um, I, I guess the sad part, you again, this is something you referenced. I, I felt bad for Sal because I always feel like, you know, botches are never good in a match, but it's one of those things where I feel like if you do them, if they're if they're at certain key moments in the match, it almost makes it worse. And I felt like 
it was right near the end of the match where he does that stunner where he doesn't grab Jay's head, but Jay goes down on it anyway, and it, so it looks kind of ugly. And 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 then right after that, this was an intentional spot, but I think combining it with the uh, the botched stunner made him look bad. Where they do this thing where Sal goes for one of his big moves, which is this huge kind of springboard flipping kick off the top rope it's it's a very show, showy thing he does this like 180 leap to the top rope and then he springboards off and lethal just does the samoa joe thing is the thing his mentor sometimes does where he just walks away calmly and the guy crashes and burns when he does a flying move and lethal then immediately hits him with the dragon suplex and that's the finish and Joe does that, and sometimes I feel like Joe has a way of doing it where, for some reason, there's just a magic of Joe where it doesn't hurt his opponent. I felt maybe it was the combination of the botch and then that or something, but it just – I felt like it made Sal look like a complete idiot where it's like he goes for this big move. It's this really kind of – flashy convolute like i'm gonna do a, a half spin jump to get to the top rope then i'm gonna do this big flying kick and for lethal just to take like two steps calmly out of the way and just be like nope and then immediately kill him i i felt it made sal look kind of like a dork in this match but overall it was a decent match in terms of entertainment i would say yeah um, i i would say i mean that's mostly what I, I i agree with that mostly i just um i don't know just sometimes these openers can be kind of like Blah, and I thought this wasn't. I thought this was this was pretty pretty fun. And uh, next up is Lacey backstage saying she found something really great when she was tel- talent scouting at the last Ring of Honor show. Just like the top manager of a business corporation, I love that she said business corporation. She did both those words. She's going to <laughs> rise, raise them to the top of the next level. The, I like that. She, she's she's Vin, she's Vince she's Vincent Adultman from um, from BoJack Horseman. I, I did a business. She's going to raise this business corporation to the top of the next level. Yeah, she, um, I like that phrase too, the top of the next level. <laughs> she's not going to go to the two levels higher, but she's going to get close. <laughs> uh, she's going to rebuild Lazy's Angels around them, and they're going to be bigger and better than ever. She's going to be scouting some more talent tonight. Gabe says, cut from behind the camera. We get that classic Ring of Honor, ooh, you're seeing something you shouldn't be seeing type thing. Because immediately after the promo ends, Jason Blade, in his one on-camera appearance on the DVD proper, walks into frame and he immediately hits on Lacey. You rec- you recognize her. Jason Blade? Like you you you, you knew that was him? Because I had no, no idea who that was. I, no, I did not. I, okay. I would love to – well, I said I would love to – I wouldn't carry the way. But no, what I did, Matt, was I got – I, I – I did the thing I normally do, which I go, who is that? Should I know who that guy is? I looked at a couple uh, old online reviews of the show. No one knew that either. So then I immediately went, okay, it's got to be someone that was on the pre-show. And I looked up everybody on the pre-show that I thought that I didn't know in their their face ready readily. And sure enough, it was Jason Blade. So that, it, it took me three steps, Matt. But that's how I, I – I had to do the research to find out who Jason Blade was. D-Vein Thrombozos, you are listening to a master at work. <laughs> Um, anyway, immediately Jason Blade uh, walks into frame. He hits on Lacey. Lacey gets angry, and we quickly cut away as we continue to tell the story of Lacey. The heel is a heel because she doesn't like men constantly perving on her. So the funny thing is, like, as soon as the you know the camera cuts, you know, you know, he goes cut, and she starts talking to the cameraman. She's like super nice and polite. She's like, "Oh, thank you so much," you know. And then, <laughs> and then, and then Jason Blade, who I just found out, comes up and hits on her. And she freaks out on him because he's doing something disgusting. So once again, she is absolutely the baby face. She's like a nice person who everybody just treats like a sack of meat. Like it's – yeah, it's like – it's amazing actually how much she seems like just like a normal person until somebody treats her like a, like she's – you know, some is a creep to her basically. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those. It's, it's crazy because you know clearly Ring of Honor at this point wants her to be this man hating heel character. But if you wanted to do that, there is a way you could do that where you, she could be seeing like flirtations when people are clearly not trying to hit on her and she's just angry at everybody. But like you said, she's nice when uh, off camera when no one's doing anything to warrant a, an angry response. And we've seen so many times now, like the way she's portraying Ring of Honor, it's like. Her character is basically every second she's not doing something, someone's hitting on her. Like you can understand why someone would get pissed off, like where they're yes. constantly being leered at and, and like these really cheap, like flagrant come ons with like no subtlety to them. Like, and like, and and as a heel manager, 
she is I don't can't recall her ever doing anything to cheat for the people that she's um that she's seconding. Can you? Not so far. And yeah, yeah. like it's just it's 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 this weird thing where you can where you can get what they're trying to do and still see how clearly they're going like the opposite way. Although I'm sure someone saw this and went, yeah, she is a bitch. Ugh. Like, I'm, I'm sure someone watched this and felt that way. But. Sure. Uh, I mean, but there's, you know, th- I mean, a lot <laughs> of those types of guys who watch, you know, wrestling DVDs, like, just think that about women in general. <laughs> <sighs> it's it's um, a sad thing to say about wrestling fans, and, you know, I don't mean to, to uh, cast aspersions, but, like, also, the aspersions come precast. <laughs> <laughs> Survival of the Fittest 2005 first round match another one Colt Cabana defeated Ricky Reyes via pinfall in 4 minutes 26 seconds after he hit a lariat and I kind of forgot at this point that Colt was really trying to establish the lariat as a finisher because he won the Nigel feud with it he he beat uh, Punk with it and now he's you know just winning random matches here with it um, I guess this was fine for a 4 minute match I, I wrote in my notes, Reyes isn't suited for a short match, but I don't know if he's suited for anything in Ring of Honor at this point, which comes off as a little harsher probably than I, I want to convey on the podcast. But I just feel like uh, he's just so there. And I think I've said this problem with uh, the Havana Pitbull's early matches before, and it's definitely continuing to be true with Ricky Reyes. Even in a four-minute match, I could tell where – it just feels like he feels like a video game wrestler in the sense that he has a set of moves and the moves kind of come out and it doesn't feel like there's like any progression. It feels like, oh, he hits that move in the first minute, but he could have just easily hit that in the eighth minute. Like he has a set of things he's going to do. He's going to do them in a random order and then the finish is going to come and then your match is going to be over. And it's very basic clubbering spots, you know, just – I'm going to club you to the back. I'm going to shove you down, you know, stuff like that. Um, There also may have been a reason why this match was short. Um, Sean Radikin from the Pro Wrestling Torch, he was there live. We'll have a few live reports from him. And he wrote, for this match, they appeared to have gone to the finish early as Reyes appeared to have injured his nose. So going in, I didn't really notice that watching the match, but I just assumed this match was short maybe because they wanted to have one match shorter because sometimes you do that in a tournament. But in Looking back, maybe he, there was some validity to this because there was no match on this night that was close to this short. So that was that. Yeah, I mean, I have so little to say about this match. It was four minutes. It was a real nothing match. I mean, like the the crowd was definitely quieter than they were for the opening. You know, Reyes did a lot of the strikes and kicks. It picked up a little bit when Colt was on offense and was doing his big four and forearms to the top of Reyes's head, which is not actually something that he does so often. So that was a little bit interesting, I suppose. Um, but ultimately, yeah, he won with that lariat again and it was, yeah, nothing match. Yeah. You're right. Reyes, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily that he, he couldn't do anything interesting. It's just the way he was presented in ROH at this point was just not working. And so his matches didn't get over pretty much ever at, in, in any of the shows that we've watched so far. And at this point, he's also – he's like the setup guy for low-key and homicide and feuds. Like we saw that with uh, Lethal where Lethal beats Reyes and that was like, oh, it's the first guy in the Rottweilers he's beat. you know. And now we're seeing here with you know Colts about to feud with Homicide. He's going to have a match with low-key coming up. So you know, Reyes is basically – Reyes at this point is basically just like the first step to anyone that's feuding with the guys people actually care about unfortunately. But yeah. – and Lacey was also scouting this match. So – and eventually she would have end up doing something with uh, Colt Cabana. So I don't know if that was that long-term of booking, but interesting little thing there. I wonder how Ricky Reyes would have comported himself in Lacey's Angels. <laughs> Definitely. Reyes, what an angel. Um, that brings us to another first-round match in the Survival of the Fittest. Roderick Strong defeated Jarrell Clark via submission in 11 minutes, 11 seconds, when he made him tap out to the stronghold. Uh, Lenny Leonard on commentary, who was doing commentary for the show with uh, Dave Prezak, he mentioned that these two had uh, previously done this match at FIP and tore down the house. What did what, what did they do to the house on on this night here, Matt, in Ring of Honor? Uh, they didn't tear it down, but I thought it was the best match of the show so far. And I, you know, if as you know, as I noted, I did enjoy the opener, so I thought this was a pretty good match. Um, you know, I mean, they they did a lot of just like fun spots that popped the crowd, you know, and like. In a match like this, where it's like a, 
you know, a first round match in a tournament with a guy who's really only been in ROH once before, that's a good way to approach a match, right? Uh, Clark did some really cool stuff and Strong is really smooth with his mat work. Like he's getting really good at this point. You know, it's like, you know, sometimes in these indie matches, you know, mat work can be so smooth that it feels robotic. Yeah. And I don't think that that's what, what this was. Like Roderick is like smooth on the map, but like still feels like he has a personality and like it's still, it manages to, you know, the charisma comes through, which is good. But like he, he, Jarrell, you know, has a lot of pretty cool spots in this match. He, he powers out of a test of strength. He then leapfrogs back over strong and hits a big back kick, which got lots of oohs and ahs. And I'm pretty sure you even posted that one on Twitter, right? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty uh, great. So, like, not only does he jump over, he does a, he's in a, he's in the test of strength. And while he's in the test of strength, he does a standing vertical leap over top of, of, of uh, Roderick and lands behind him and then does the backwards kick and hits him in the face. Like, it's crazy athleticism he has. Yes, and the crowd absolutely appreciated it. He follows that by sending Strong to the floor. And doing like a 619 style swing, but then he grabs Roderick's head with his legs and does like a head scissors on the floor. Um, you know, Strong comes back, he does his chops, and his chops do not disappoint. Um, Clark hits a springboard moonsault that impresses, and then he impresses again with a flip bump off a strong clothesline. Um, you know, and when, when Roderick takes over, it definitely slows down a bit. He does like a very rough version of the Three Amigos without the smooth transitions and a very delayed final suplex. Um, Clark does a pump handle suplex, but it was like a very explosive pump handle suplex. Like it was an above average pump handle suplex, I would say. Um, and then he does a, a handspring corkscrew press for two, which I thought was just a really nice sequence. He does a, sh- a standing shooting star press, strong for his part, he military presses Clark into the turnbuckle, which the crowd goes nuts for. Um, Clark uh, reverses a tilt to world slam into a swinging DDT. Then he reverses a power bomb into like a, a Matt Seidel style snap Rana. Um, just lots of really cool spots in this match. Uh, Clark hits a springboard moonsault from the apron into the ring for two. Uh, and Strong comes back right immediately with the half Nelson backbreaker into the stronghold for the immediate tap out. Like I didn't really get the sense that there was some deep story to this match, but uh, you know, sometimes it's good to just do a lot of cool stuff and make the crowd pop. And that's what this match did. And the crowd obviously wanted to see more of Jarrell Clark. And we didn't see much more of him in ROH, honestly, (laughs) but um, yeah, there's been two Jarrell Clark matches so far that we've reviewed. And, he was impressive in both. I thought he was much more impressive in this one because he obviously had a better opponent and stuff. But I really thought this was a heck of a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I thought this was an outright good match, and I really enjoyed this. Thought it was a really good showcase for Clark. And Strong looked great, too. Like like the Lethal match, I thought this was another guy where Strong up to this point hadn't had many matches in Ring of Honor yet where – he kind of got to lead the match, but obviously as he was rising up the card, he was going to start getting more of those. And I thought he did a really good job here of kind of leading Drell through this match in the sense of, like, I thought in the first two thirds he did a good job of, he would control the match, but then he would always let, like, Drell do one cool spot that he'd bring it back down again. But but he let, let Drell have plenty, but it would always be in these little isolated bursts. And then the last third, they kind of went more back and forth. I thought... You know, Strong did really good playing kind of almost the muscly bully. Like, you know, playing, even though he, you know, you would look at Strong and go, why is this guy named Strong? Like, he's not really looking like a strong man, but like his offense really could lean into the, that stuff. Cause like you mentioned, you know, the rolling suplexes into a delayed vertical suplex where he does that power slam toss into the buckle. He hit a really hard power bomb in this match too that just looked really like on as far as power, power bombs go, like very painful. And yeah, Clark, I thought this was a great showcase for him. It's it's funny because a lot of guys, um, I feel like if if you put them in a match like this where there's no story, no feud, and it's just and you're the new guy, so you're not over and you don't really get to show off a character, or maybe in Clark's case you don't really have a character to show off, and you just get to do isolated spots, it's not a great showcase for you. But Clark is one of those guys where Pretty much everything he did in this match was really cool and was designed to get a reaction and did get a reaction where I feel like that completely works for a guy like in his position because I feel like you come away from this match going, yeah, I really want to see more Drill Clark because 
pretty much everything I think he did in this match was like a interesting crowd pleasing move that really showed off how just incredible natural athleticism this guy had. Um, you, you mentioned the highlight spots to me, all those spots you mentioned, I think are, are, are the best spots in this match. And it, it, it's interesting in the sense of, I feel like a lot of times on, on through the years, when we've seen guys that did not make it ring of honor and they've gotten a few little matches, we, we, we would watch them. We'd go, well, maybe they didn't get enough time or whatever, but we could see, say like based on the performances, I could see why this guy didn't get more bookings or, or become a big star in ring of honor. But so far, like you mentioned, I think we're two for two on matches where you come away from this guy at the time, I would say, and go, oh, that guy is a guy to watch for Ring of Honor. Because I think both times he had very good personal performances. And I feel this time was not just a good personal performance. I think it was an outright good match. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, like we've mentioned a lot on this show over the – through the years that um, <laughs> when um, – sometimes when guys get like a, a brief – chance to wrestle on an ROH show people with some buzz they just they don't really get any time and don't get a chance to really do anything Jarrell Clark's gotten a chance to really show his stuff and he's really made the most of it and like that's kind of what we like to see and it's weird yeah. yeah I mean I guess just the the answer is probably like every once in a while somebody talented slips through the cracks I mean he did have a run in TNA but it was not as a pushed guy at all right like he would be like opening match guy like he for you know like didn't he have it it wasn't even a tag team like he definitely was in TNA, right? Yeah, I, 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 I it wasn't a major role, but it was yeah. like he did have a lot of bookings there. And the funny thing is, he, like clearly, Gabe saw something in him because in in two thousand six, there is that generation now or or whatever. There's that show where basically Gabe tries to make another generation next kind of eight man tag where it's like here's the next generation, and he's one of the guys in that match. It's like him. And uh, Davy Richards and the Christ brothers, and and even and even when you look at his cage match, like after Ring of Honor, you know he doesn't get many more matches in Ring of Honor, but he keeps working in FIP like steadily as a regular for a couple more years. So clearly they liked him to some degree. So I don't know what happened. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, you know who who knows? We'll find who, out. But yeah, who knows? Um, so yeah, after the match, Clark gets a nice round of applause as the ref helps him to the back. He gets a please come back chant. So kind of going to our point. And then next we get a shot of Kenta Kobashi warm up in a hallway backstage, not at this building, presumably at the building of the next show we will be covering as an on-screen graphic says coming to ring of honor. Matt, I believe this is the first on acknowledgement on a DVD that uh, Kenta Kobashi was coming to Ring of Honor. And we talked on the last they, show. They mentioned, they mentioned it on commentary at the last DVD. Like this, so it's the second time. But it's the first time we actually see a graphic or see him. Uh, we mentioned on a recent show, I, I forget if it was the last show or the show before that, but we were like kind of surprised like knowing the timeline of when they actually announced he was coming to Ring of Honor – like in the building was months earlier, like how they weren't pushing him harder. And it felt like this was the one show where they were like, oh shit, Kobashi's on the next show. Cause they, they really try and push him on this show in a way they rarely try to push up upcoming shows on Ring of Honor DVDs. But it's, it's like all on this one show, they really do the full court press. It's a weird approach, but I guess the, I mean, I guess in the end of the day, what it, the truth is, it doesn't really matter. No one's buying a DVD because of what, was said on the previous DVD, they're buying DVDs because they go online and they hear the buzz, right? So, like, yeah. I guess in the at, at in the end, it really in the end, it doesn't even matter. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Rest in peace. Yes. Um, and, and it ended up being their best selling DVD ever. So, I mean, it, it, yeah. they didn't need obviously they didn't need it, but no, but it, but it's it's satisfying to watch something well built on a show before you get to the the big thing, right? You know, like. Just as from an entertainment standpoint, like it, it, from a business standpoint, it probably didn't make any difference. But just like from an entertainment standpoint, like it is satisfying to be to like for them to try to hype you up for something, you know? Yeah. And next up, we have a survival of the fittest first round match. Uh, Austin Aries defeated Jimmy Rave, who was escorted to the ring by Jay Chung at Prince Nana by disqualification in 12 minutes, 54 seconds when Rave hit him in the back with a chair and the ref saw it. So, um. Like most Jimmy Rave matches, I thought this had a very simple logic and structure that made made sense. 
Uh, Ares rushes to the ring. He's pissed off because they're in the middle of a feud. He attacks Rave before the bell even rings and before he can, Rave can even get his robe off. Uh, Rave retreats to the floor and then Ares hits him with one of the craziest topes I have ever seen. It is that they call it at this point the heat seeking missile where he goes between the bottom and the second rope at high velocity. And what makes it crazy is Rave has his back to Ares. Like, he kind of looks over his shoulder to see Ares coming at the last second, but Ares basically, it looks like he hits Rave high, like in the shoulders or maybe even the head, and like, er Rave was barely even like, looking at him. It just seemed absolutely nuts. I, I he can't he will do he will do a heat he missile to somebody's back a couple of years after this, um, which hopefully we will eventually get to. And let's just say it doesn't go very well. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's a reason why this isn't a regular spot for him. I think we'll find out. Um, and then Ares proceeds to kick Rave's ass all around ringside. And it's just, it's just this incredibly hot start to the match. The crowd's loving it. And then Nana distracts Ra Ares. Rave gains control off that distraction, which is, you know, classic heel psychology where the face controls, kicks ass, and the only way the heel gets control is when he gets, he gets to cheat. And then at that point, we get a, uh, a long kind of rave control section, at least for a few minutes of sustained control until Ares makes his comeback. Then we get a back and forth final few minutes until the finish. So classic solid match structure, which I think sometimes is really rave strong put strong point. But the problem with this is I thought raves control sequence in the middle was really boring. And even though it was only probably just a few minutes, it felt like forever. And I think, and even started to do draw isolated boring chants, which is something I feel like in Ring of Honor, we almost never hear. And um, I think the thing is, the, what, what made it boring was Rave consciously pairs down his offense as a heel. He does he does less exciting stuff, and I don't have a problem with that. But in this match, it's not just that his stuff isn't as flashy. It's that he does the same two or three things over and over again, which is something he usually doesn't fall into the trap of. Like, you watch this match, and it feels like for hours, and again, it's probably just a minute or two, but, like, whips Ares into a corner, punches him in the corner for a while, whips Ares into the other corner, punches him in the corner for a while. And it just feel, feels like the same, like, monotonous thing over and over again. And it really just takes the match down from such a hot start. And it was also one of the rare matches. Like, his offense is very basic. Like, it's one of the rare matches in Ring of Honor, I think you'll find, where two guys fight over who gets to hit just a standard vertical suplex. But then, in a weird way, it all works out because when Ares finally does make his comeback, the crowd is really hot for it, probably because they're so desperate for action. So in a way you could see, well, that I, I'm sure someone would say, well, that, isn't that the point is that the heel is so boring that the face gets even more over because they're excited to see him um, make the comeback. And there, it was fun in a way because Rave throwing so many punches during his sequence paid off in a couple ways because like at one point when Ares on his comeback, Rave again tries to throw punches but this time Ares beats him to the punch literally like every time where Rave raises his fist and then Ares punches him in the face first so that was a cool kind of satisfying comeback and then later he goes for the 10 count punches to get more punch based revenge Rave sneaks away through his legs and then Ares just does like a jumping back elbow off the turnbuckles to get the 10th punch on, on the 10 count punches which I thought was cool and then the end is like your standard back and forth fun run but it was kind of anticlimactic where um it, it's, it's it's a weird example of something that like we were talking just earlier on the show about how things that like in wrestling like that aries and roderick promo that makes sense but was weird because it's like something that never happens like them being so cordial to each other in a competitive environment and this was kind of the same way where matt i have rarely seen an example of this where Someone jumps – Jade Chung near the end of the match. She jumps on the apron to distract the ref. She successfully distracts the ref. Nana comes in the ring and uh, Rave ends up getting a chair for, and uh, hits Ares with the chair. But the problem is like Jade successfully distracts the ref, but eventually it was like the ref was like, okay, I've talked for you long enough. He, and he turns around in time to see the chair shot. And it was like – it was the – I've seen so many times in wrestling like the distraction either not work at all or work perfectly. And this was a, a weird example of like, it worked. And I was like, okay, long enough. And then it didn't work. It was, it was just a really weird middle ground and kind of created for an unsatisfying finish. And the other thing that I thought was funny about it, Matt was, I don't know if you noticed this, but in the middle of the match, 
Aries goes for a brain buster and Jade Chung jumps on the apron and like no one really in the match really reacts to it. Not even the ref. And she then like hops back down and Nana does some like in character brow beating of her. And I thought, what the heck was that for? And then the in- ending of the match is Aries going for the brain buster. And that's when Jade jumps on the, on the apron. And this time the ref gets distracted and then Nana comes in the ring and the chair finish happens. And so I realized, Oh, like so they must've told her before the match, when Aries goes for the brain buster, you jump on the apron, except Aries decided to go for the brain buster. Like a second time in the match earlier on, it's just like a, a, a fight for a spot. And Jade jumps on the ring and it's not the time for her to do the finish. So it's one of those weird things where if you watch this match, look out for that. Cause it, it becomes really obvious once you figure out what's going on. But, uh, Overall, I would say it's an above average match. I I was t- I have way too many thoughts on this random mid card match, but I, I was torn, Matt, between I really like Aries' comeback, I really like the opening, but that boring was re- that that middle part was really boring. So overall, it was like above average, but it just it depends on how you that how you think that some of the the part. What is the sum of those parts, I would say? Uh, well, first of all, for the Chung thing, it might actually even work from a character standpoint in the sense of, you know, Nana said, distract Ares if he goes for the brain buster. You know, like, mm-hmm. and so so she jumps on, so she goes up there twice. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so you could you could actually make the argument anyway. Um, as far as the match, um, I think this is one of the, I guess maybe the first of these op- mid-card matches that I liked less than you. I really, really did enjoy the beginning. I thought it was really hot. The, uh, you know, the crazy tope, the brawling around ringside. I almost think the match would have been better if it just stayed like that. And it was like five minutes shorter. Um, cause I did think it got pretty dull and I don't think that Aries comeback was really made up for it. Um, in the way that you did, like, I, I just, I didn't get as into it. Um, it's just, you know, they were trying to make things, they just tried to keep things so basic and then do that screwy heel finish and it just didn't, it just didn't work for me. Um, the other thing that bugs me is this whole thing with the, they're really trying to get over the whole, well, we need an authority figure in ROH. And, you know, Leonard on commentary, clearly this is like the ROH version of like Vince and somebody's headset because you could so hear Gabe talking every time Leonard really hammers home the, we need an authority figure. This is why we need an authority figure. Like, you know, that's so obviously Gabe, you know? Um, But it just bugs me because like, first of all, the whole concept of an authority figure as if there's nobody in charge of ROH in the back, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like right now, nobody's in charge, but also like authority figure, like that's like a character, you know, like, there was always supposed to be an authority. But then the other thing is like, what would an authority figure have done about this? The referee saw the chair shot and disqualified the guy who did it. Isn't that all you can do? Like you, yeah. you disqualify the person. I mean, that's all any wrestling promotion does. I don't remember once like Cornette comes in, he starts like suspending people for doing chair shots. Right. So yeah. I, so I don't think that it, like it just does, the logic doesn't hold. And also, if anything, they're enforcing the rules more now than they used to be because we would always talk about how like homicide just would randomly use a chair in the middle of a match, like every other match and the referee would just be like, okay. So. I don't know. The logic doesn't really hold for me with this whole like building to the authority figure thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think I liked both the rave Aries matches a little bit more than you. I just, I I think more than most people looking at the reviews too. I just, I felt like they had decent chemistry in some ways. I liked when, uh, that spot near the end where, uh, rave does the gonorrhea to, uh, Aries and Aries lands on his feet out of it and goes right into the kick to the head to set up the finish is his kind of finish combo. I really thought that was cool. But Matt, the most important thing about this match, this is where I really noticed it, but I noticed it all night. We have to talk about this. The survival of the fittest font they use to, to, after every one of these matches, it's like, you know, winner of this match or survival of the fittest qualifier. They use this font, which is oftentimes not legible. Like, like it's, it's it's a font I can only describe as like the scrawlings of a madman. Like, like, (laughs) Like the, there, are, if you if you for people that watch the show, there are some matches results where when when they show the graphic, like even if you know the result, you still can't understand it. Like I know it's supposed to say you know Austin Aries defeats blank, and I still couldn't quite make it out. I'm like I know what they've written, and I can't find where where the letters are. Like it's it was the worst possible choice for thought. So um, so so this is this is the match where you notice it, or this is the only match where you saw it. 
This is the match where I noticed it. And then after this, I was like the other matches. I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. But this was the match where I went, what the hell does that say? And it's like, I know what this says. And I still don't know <laughs> what it says. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I I defy people to make out some of these like just just show someone that doesn't know wrestling some screen caps of some of these these uh font these declarations of who won and just sit, tell ask them like can you tell me what these people's names are what's well, this supposed to say and well, I would be shocked it, if they get some of these it's up to you to do these screen caps I guess. You are the you are the king of the, oh, no. the of the screen cap. Um, the other the other important thing about this match is like this is the last J- Jade Chung appearance before she finally um, turns on the embassy, right? Like, so do you think they have sufficiently built this up, like as this is the moment of her breaking point? It feels like they, uh, there was more heat on it, like honestly, like a month earlier than there is now. I was about to say it feels like they've kind of hit the same note a little too long. Yeah, maybe they wait. And they like- waited too long. <laughs> And I feel like almost like the Foley stuff was more like there was weren't haven't they done like one or two times of like Jade starting to speak up for herself or like dancing with cold and like those were moments where it felt like okay Jade's finally starting to like get ready to challenge these guys and recently it just feels like they've gone back to her being completely submissive. Yeah, all treading water a bit. Yeah. Uh after the match, Raven and Nana keep putting the boots to Aries until Roderick Strong runs them off. So they're kind of keeping the the strong. Obviously, they're keeping the Generation Next Embassy feud going, but also it's kind of a through line through the show with the opening promo and the end. Night. This is really their kind of night, Roderick and Aries together. Um, that brings us to a survival of the fittest first round match. Another one: Samoa Joe defeats the debuting Milano Collection AT via pinfall in fourteen twenty after hitting the Muscle Buster. Matt, I'm going to take this match just because I want to, because I have some thoughts on this matchup, because I took the really short Colt Reyes matchup, because I think this way you get two of the bigger matches the rest of the way, including the main event. Um, So executive quick decision off the bat, springing on you, but I'm just going to say uh, I thought this was pretty unique as far as Samoa Joe matches go. I thought he gave a... Milano quite a bit. And of course, for people that don't know Milano Collection AT, he was a guy from Dragon Gate who eventually after his – this was a point in his career where he was having a run on the American Indies and then he'd go back to uh, New Japan. Eventually, an injury would force him to retire. But he is still to this day, I believe, a Japanese color commentator for uh, New Japan. Um, but anyway, this was his debut in Ring of Honor. And it, I, I thought this was like – more of a pure style match in the first part of it than some pure style matches Samoa Joe had done as champ because there's just a lot of technical wrestling from both of the guys in the first few minutes that I really enjoyed. And uh, I thought this was just a good showcase from Milano because you can see he's a guy that he just has a lot of different tools. Like he has a good look. He has a bit of charisma. He has good size for ring of honor in the sense of like, He's probably not tall in general, but like in Ring of Honor, you notice that, oh, he's like taller than Joe. Um, and he just has a really intriguing mix of in-ring skills where he has obviously a good kind of technician. Like I really dug him at one point. He gets out of a wrist lock just by walking onto the ring apron and then kind of, well, in the wrist lock, pulling Joe's arm against the rope and kind of hooking it to kind of like turn it against him. And he also has some great athleticism when any, not just great athleticism, but like great athleticism when you don't expect it. Like he does a moment where, he does uh, uh, just he, he goes into the splits at one mo- moment and Joe does like a lucha tumble over the top of a uh, of Milano doing the splits where you go like, whoa, I would not expect to see that from from Joe. It's just a crazy little moment. And he does like really cool athletic stuff. Uh, Milano, like the Armani shoe exchange, which is this really great springboard twisting press. There's a bit of miscommunication in the match at one point. Um, Milano tries to reverse an Irish whip and he loses Joe's hand. And Joe responds really well. I have to assume this was an ad lib where he just beats the shit out of Milano instead of doing the planned spot. And they do another rarity for Ring of Honor right after that where they basically – Joe just has the ref do like a standing 10 count. They tease like a knockout for Milano, but he gets up, which again, really interesting that they just do that on what seems like it just came from a botch. A nice recovery there. And then – Joe also this match looks like he just he gives Milano a lot, but then when he beats up Milano, it looks like he just kills him a couple of times. Like a kick that looks like it cut him right in the face. He it looks like he slapped him really hard right on the face. Like he he was kicking Milano's ass. And the end was very Joe. And it's something that 
I talked about how like lethal did that walk away spot that Joe does sometimes and spots that Joe sometimes can get away with and others can't. I thought this was an example because this is a match where um, Joe gives Milano a fair bit. And at the end of the match, Milano's like really on a roll. He's hitting bigger moves and Joe just gets up. He's like, he's pissed off. He hits Milano with a death Valley driver. He's screaming motherfucker while he hits it. And then he hits it with the muscle buster and it's over. And it's almost a Hulk up type finish. And Joe can do this occasionally where he like, he's getting, he's getting in trouble and he kind of just wakes up and realizes I'm Samoa Joe. He hits a couple big moves and it's just definitively over. And for some people, I think some wrestlers that would seem too cartoony or, or too dismissive of his opponent, but Joe, there's just something about it where he makes it work in my opinion. Like it feels like a sports team that's a heavy favorite over another team, but yet they're losing a game and they turn on in the final five minutes and just remember like, Oh, we're the better team. And just being better for five minutes is enough for them to come back and win the game. And for some reason, it I feel like it did not make Milano look bad. It just made Joe look good. But overall, I thought this was a good kind of unique Joe match. And I thought this was a good showcase for Milano collection. Yeah, I would pretty much agree with everything you said. I thought it was a good, a good match. Like, you know, they did not go all out. Like, it's not like they were trying to steal the show, but they were very good at what they did for the most part. And, you know, they're two good wrestlers. Obviously, Joe's obviously a phenomenal wrestler. And they, they did a good, they did a good job. I mean, I like that, you know, cause I haven't seen a ton of Milano, uh, collection AT, you know, in general, like in Japan yeah. and stuff like that. I, I haven't, I don't know. Have you seen a lot of his stuff? No, I I watched when because he was getting buzzed probably around this era before this like in the T two P the Torimon project it was a like a spinoff Torimon with different style guys and I watched some of that and I, I watched a bit of him when he went to New Japan after this but yeah this was a lot of my experience was him on this little indie run here yeah that's where he pretty- would work here he would work he worked in like IWA Mid South against Chris here like he worked in a bunch of places in the U S for a period of months at this point. Right. Yeah. I, that, that's pretty much the extent of what I've seen of him. But, you know, he does a lot of like splits. Like you mentioned, he does a split. He does a few of those. Like, and at one point he, he, um, avoids a lariat by like doing a back bend and Prazak describes it as, so he's matrixing, which I, which I enjoy that call. Um, but yeah, like, you know, he does the thing where he ties up Joe in the ropes and then does the drop kick. The crowd really loves that. Um, the botches are like, they're kind of weird. Like they, like they, they mess up an Irish whip, right? Yeah. Which is like, you know, you don't see that too often, but it's also <laughs> not a big deal. I mean, people, people uh, like Joe enough and appreciate Milano enough. They didn't really care. You know, that, that stuff really only makes a huge difference if it takes the crowd out of the match. And this definitely didn't do that. Um, as far as the Joe where he just like kind of wakes up and hits a couple big moves and wins, I think it works sometimes. I think sometimes it feels too abrupt. I think it was fine here. You know, this is a first round match in a tournament against a guy who's not really presented in Joe's league. So I think it's okay. I also appreciated that it was, um, you know, Joe's beating a, 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 ja- a star from Japan right before he wrestles, you know, a much bigger star from Japan. So I think that works too. So, I never thought of that. That's yeah. really an interesting point. I never even thought of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So overall, you know, I agree with you. It is a good match. And that's really all it needed to be. Yeah. Um, it, also, I, I guess I should – I forgot to mention Milano has an invisible dog, which is funny to see like a wrestler that clearly Ring of Honor was high on um, – Like he had such a silly little accoutrement to his gimmick where he would come out for these shows for those who have never seen it and he would carry a dog leash, but the dog leash was made kind of stiff. So it would be kind of like the bottom part of it would be like floating in the air and he would just – the announcers on Law Promotion would be like, oh, that's his invisible dog. And it's just funny because to juxtapose that with this kind of stuff because in The Observer, Dave wrote – Gabe Sapolsky said of Milano Collection AT, who debuts in Ring of Honor on uh, September 24th and has a few more dates after, that if he knew he had the guy for a long period of time, he'd make him world champion. Milano has gotten rave reviews from several indie promotions in the U.S. who have contacted us that he's worked for in the past few weeks. So, yeah. Hmm, Easy for for him to say. You know, oh yeah, I I would make him world champion. 
I mean, Milano either was really impressing everybody or he had a great agent because Dave and I had a different quote that I just took out for because it was more basically more of the same. But like Dave was just saying that basically every indie promoter in the U.S. during this run was like raving to to him about like how amazing Milano Collection AT was. And he does look good in the, in this thing. But it's funny because maybe Gabe really believed that. Maybe not. I was kind of getting Vordell Walker flashbacks a little bit when Gabe was like, I'm scared people are going to hire this guy away from me. And then, Yes, although not, that's not exactly a fair uh, comparison. But yes, no. I, I, I agree. I, I mean, listen, was there wouldn't have been a better choice for champion at this time than Brian Danielson. So I guess it's good for ROHs that they didn't have Milano Collection AT for longer. <laughs> um. And also gave inter- – this was a, a continuing the, the real push for uh, Kobashi because I believe G- – this is the moment where during this match, Gabe interrupts commentary, does one of his commentary run-ins to announce Kobashi versus Joe. So Heaven's just like in the middle of this Joe match. The, his last match, like you mentioned before Kobashi, they're just like, oh, yeah, facing Kobashi next show. His last singles um, match at least, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, because he has the main event, of course. Um so after the match, Joe and Milano shake hands. Joe leaves the ring so Milano can get a big chant of his name along with please come back chant. He screams, thank you, really loud as he goes back through the curtain. Thought that was adorable. Uh, survival of the fittest first round match, the final first round match. Uh, Christopher Daniels defeated James Gibson via pinfall in 26 minutes, one second after he hit the last rights. Uh, Matt, I'm going to be honest. I gave this to you one because I also want to have you, the, you to have the main event. and because, But also because I'll be honest. I don't have a lot to say about this match, which seems crazy for a match with these two guys of this level going this long. But I'm hoping you can kind of spur me on because I don't have that much to say about this match. What did you think about it? Well, so I knew this match was going to be really long. I had read, I, 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 you know, I hadn't seen it in many, many years. It wasn't the sort of match that I would like. I want to go back and watch this, but like I saw this was like close to thirty minutes, and I was like, you know, even though like these are two good wrestlers, there was still a part of me that was like, ugh. This is probably going to be pretty boring because it's so long. And I have to say, I do think it was too long. And I don't think it built the crowd to the point that it needed to. But I thought they kept it entertaining for 30 minutes. I never found it boring. I thought it was better than I thought it would be. And like that's weird to say because it wasn't great. And these are two great wrestlers. But I did not expect the match to be great. Like, if that makes sense, like yeah. just, just the style that, that I expected them to work on a mid card match. Like I thought it would be dull and I don't think it was dull. I think they kept it, they kept it solidly entertaining, um, for the whole time, even though there wasn't that much to it with that length. But you know, what I, what I will say is this, um, I like that they started the match with a little bit more attitude. Like it wasn't like a slow feeling out process that you usually get in a 30 minute ROH match or like any ROH match, like like Daniels is pissed off like because he wanted the world title shot because if Gibson had retained against Danielson it would have been a world title match so so Daniels comes in with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder i like that Gibson has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder because he he had lost the title the week before so i appreciated that um yeah there was like you know they do a lot of throwing into the guardrails and stuff like you know the usual thing that ROH matches do to show that they're intense um, and, you know, in the early part, um, like D- Daniels works the, uh, the back, which is pretty good. He does some big hold. He does an elbow from the apron over the top rope. Um, uh, Gibson escapes the cross face by turning it into an ankle lock, which I don't know, was that an homage to the Benoit versus angle matches? Cause that's, that's, those are the matches I think of when you get those reversals. Um, but you know, um, Gibson is, you know, hit some big suplexes, uh, at first he starts working on the arm, but then he stops. This is something I notice a lot in ROH matches. Like they do a lot of like limb work at the beginning of long matches. And then they decide midway through, actually, I'm focus. I'm going to focus on another body part, not this one. Um, at the very beginning, it seemed like Gibson was targeting, um, Daniel's, um, arm, but then he goes toward the neck. And it's interesting because, the, the announcers talk a lot in this match about how Gibson is working on Daniel's neck, 
Yeah. But it didn't look to me like he was working on his neck that much. Like it seemed to me like he was working on his back a lot of the time. Like like the idea was he's working on the neck because Daniel's neck is I guess is weak and he has the guillotine choke. But the moves didn't really feel that way to me. Like it, it, I don't know. It was just like I was looking for it and it was like occasionally he does stuff to the neck, but it didn't seem like he was micro targeting the way the announcers were trying to sell that he was. You know, he does some head scissors and stuff, and he he chokes Daniel a little bit with the wrist tape, but like. Not a ton of stuff from that. Um, Daniels tries to pick up the pace at one point. He hits a, a springboard back elbow and screams to fire up the crowd. And they end up hip tossing each other over the top rope to the floor. And Daniels ends up bleeding a bit. And they they both fight for a suplex. And Gibson hits a brain buster. And at this point, the crowd does seem to be booing Gibson a bit as he goes for the best moonsault ever. And he misses that. This is Gibson who tries to do that. Yeah. And Leonard notes that Gibson is taking too long between moves, and he definitely is taking time between moves. And, you know, Daniels hits some of his big moves, gets a couple two counts. He goes for the cloverleaf, which is Gibson's move, and Gibson blocks that, reaches the ropes, and he pulls himself up from the ropes and grabs the guillotine choke, which I think is actually a pretty cool reversal. And Daniel seems to be fading, but he bridges into a pinning combo, which gets Gibson to release the hold. Um, they do the they do the thing where they're trading shots in the middle of the ring, and Gibson hits a running high knee and a sudden power slam, like a Samoa Joe style power slam for two. And Daniels escapes a pile driver, goes for a Death Valley driver. Gibson turns that into a crucifix for two. Um, Gibson turns the Angels' wings into a roll up, gets a two count, and then Daniels just gets a really sudden last rights and gets the win. Like I said. I don't think they really built to like a peak. I don't think the match needed to be a half hour long. I, I, I just I just don't know what they got out of doing that. Um, I feel like if you're going to go a half hour, you need to have a really awesome match. That's how I feel. Like there's no reason to do a half hour good match. You want if you're going to do a half hour, you need it to be a great match. And this was not a great match. But I was less bored than I thought I would be. Um, I agree. Mo- I pretty much agree with you. I I, I thought it was like. It was weird. it was a good match, I would say overall, but like you, I thought it was too long, and I, I believe I've used this this phrase before, like the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. Like I, I definitely believe it's one of those kinds of matches. Well, where, do you do you agree with me? Like if you're gonna go like thirty minutes or longer, you really need to have a great match. Yeah, because I, I, I've said this before, but average at ten minutes or even decent or like a better than average at ten minutes is different than. 30 minutes decent because like I, I, the comparison I always make a classic Trevor Dame food analogy would be, um, you know, if I have a little bit of mashed potatoes on my plate, that's a great part of my meal. I don't want to eat a giant bowl full of just mashed potatoes. Like I don't want a lot of average or bland or decent. Like I, I want a little, a little bit in the middle of some good stuff is great sometimes. Like it, you know, it's like, Oh, this is another thing that's kind of adding to the show but it's not a highlight and to me yeah it's it's a huge like i totally relate to you when you said early on that like even though you knew these guys were two good wrestlers when you knew how long it was you were kind of like hesitant to watch the match because sometimes and it is with a guy like Daniels, i have to admit sometimes like when i see he has a long match like this it'll be like you i watch these shows in pieces for the podcast i like also sometimes i'll have to like kind of psych myself up to be like oh yeah do I really want to put aside like a half an hour right now for this? And like, and make sure and make sure you're not too tired when you know you're watching yeah, a long yeah. ROH match. Yeah. yeah, like I feel like I have to be in a good state of mind because there are sometimes where I can be kind of an average or not in a great mood to watch wrestling, and I can watch a match and it'll like get me pumped. I feel like in these matches, to be fair to it, I have to be like in a fairly good frame of mind coming in because like if I'm not in a mood to watch or just kind of you know had a bad day, like I'm gonna tune out of this kind of match very quickly. Because they're because um, they can be slow, you know. Like that's that's yeah. that, that's all there is to it. Like some slow, like an interesting is good, but like just slow, like basic wrestling is it's boring. Like it's just you know, like if, especially if you're you're tired, like you know, like it's they, it can be it can be interesting for like ten fifteen minutes, but when you get to the thirty minute point, you really better have some excitement in there. And I think, well, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I agree in, in the sense, too, you were talking about, like, you expect more from this match because of the length and because of the guys in it. But also, when you look at this show, you know, Survival of the Fittest, its concept alone was not, clearly not the kind of concept that was like, I, I think Survival of the Fittest is a perfectly fine tournament concept. Like, it's a very simple 
standard tournament concept, but it was never a, the concept was never a draw. And if you look at it, like, there, there is no, this is the only thing that's close to a marquee matchup on this show going in. Like, on paper, if you were going to buy a ticket for the show, what's interesting on this card? It's Milano Collection AT, if you're a real big wrestling nerd, that's intriguing that he's coming to face Samoa Joe. And then there's some other matches that could be good, but they're not really exciting on paper. There's a Nigel versus BJ Whitmer P, uh, pure title match. Again, I don't think that's exciting on paper. Really, the selling points on the show are, you know, Christopher Daniels and James Gibson. And I believe a match commentary says had never taken place before. And then you just hope and assume that the main event's going to be cool. And, and so, like, yeah, there, I actually think there was a fair bit of a in that sense that, you know, there's a fair bit of expectations on this match. It's the final first round match. So it's kind of like the main event of the first round. And yeah, it doesn't live up to that. I would say, well, I, well, I would say, I would say at the time I would agree with you. I'm just saying like knowing what I know now, like about like my tastes and like what these ROH matches tend to be at these different lengths and what each of these guys do in ROH. That's what I'm saying. I didn't have high expectations knowing I was going to watch it now. I'm not talking about what my expectations were when I saw the match announced back then. You know what I mean? Christopher Daniels has had a on his comeback. It's funny because everyone talks about how AJ Styles on his return to Ring of Honor was not the AJ Styles pre the TNA enforced sabbatical from Ring of Honor. I would say Christopher Daniels, it seems like he's given his full effort, but in terms of his matches, he's had a bunch of longer matches now that have been very met, like the hour long match with Punk, you know, obviously that had the time constraints of being an hour, I mean, not the constraints, but the challenge of being an hour long. You know, good match, but definitely the worst long match I think we've seen in Ring of Honor up to this point. The Colt Cabana match was long, and I think we both agreed that was disappointing. You know, the the, the Matt Hardy match was fine. Like, Daniels just hasn't really done it for me on the comeback. Oh, I thought that I thought that at the time. I would have told you that in 2005. Like, his, his ROH stuff and his comeback was not that exciting for the most part. And I would say this whole match is kind of like a kind of microcosm of Christopher Daniels himself where it hums along the whole way at kind of this medium pace. It's never boring, but it's never, it never hits a high, high. It's, it never hits a low, low. It never hits a high, high. It, it, it makes sense, but it doesn't really pay, have a huge payoff. Like, like it, like most Christopher Daniels longer matches, you know, like you mentioned, it has dueling body park work where each guy picks a, a body part works over it. But like a lot of Christopher Daniels matches, it doesn't really have this big satisfying payoff at the end. Like the finish, it, it doesn't really pay that off. What makes you feel like it was worth investing all your time to it. I agree with you that I did like how Daniels brought some emotion into the match and, you know, reference kind of, it's not really a storyline, but the idea, like you can openly hear him giants, not with a mic, but he's loud enough that you can hear him being, being like, you know, this was, should have been for the title. You know, you ruined it. I you know, by losing the title, I like that. They actually, they probably threw more strikes in this match than you'd expect these two to throw against each other. And they brawled around ringside early on. So I like that element of it, but yeah, it just went too long and it wasn't worth the time commitment. Um, I also feel like if you're, it should, even though I agree, it should have been shorter. I also feel like, if you're going this long, maybe you should have gone like 29 minutes to try and get some drama out of a time limit drop because the the weird thing in this match was on commentary, multiple times the commentators are really trying to sell like, oh, these matches only have a 30-minute time limit. This could go to a draw. But yet they don't do time calls on this show. And like you, you the crowd gives you no indication that the crowd is – um worry that it's going to go to a draw, but I feel like if you're already going 26 minutes, if you did time calls and you went right to 29, maybe you get a little bit more excitement in that final minute. Cause, the, cause there is, I think precedent of the idea of having like a double elimination and then both guys are eliminated. So you could have built up the, some drama there, but you know, this is one thing I actually agree with Jim Cornette on. He, cause he sometimes make the, makes this comment. It's, just, it's laziness, like, that wrestling companies don't do this, but they did it back in the old, like, the real old days, which is they would just do time calls every five minutes in every single match. Yeah. And, like, it's just more work to do that. But, like, what you, by, by doing that, it means that it's less predictable if there is a time limit draw, you know, when it goes, when they start doing those calls. But also, it adds drama when you have a situation like this. And again, like, you know, they don't do it because they have to pay more, then they have to pay more attention to the time. But like, it would be better if they did that. Like if every single match had like a five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute call, they still do it in Japan, don't they? Yeah. And, and, um, 
AEW does, I don't think they do it consistently. I think there was one match at least on, on, I think there were time calls, at least on some matches on, on full gear. I'm not sure. Like, were there? Like, it feels like they do it inconsistently there too. Cause I remember, you know, at, uh, Grand Slam that I was at, they did it for the Danielson Omega match. I guess you couldn't really hear it on TV. Um, but I don't remember them doing it for any of the other matches. But I completely agree with you and with the Cornet thing, which is you either have to do it all the time or not all because otherwise you're just tipping it off if you're only doing it for time limit draws. Right. Because- Apparently Cornette told this story about when he went to ROH and he was like, um, oh, why aren't you doing the time calls for this match? And he was like, oh, because then it will let everyone know that it's a draw. And it's like, well, if you do it all the time, it wouldn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's one of those things where, where people might say, oh, well, you're doing the time calls all the time just for um, a time limit draw that happens only once in a while. But like like you were saying, I think that makes every match that goes even remotely long more exciting. And, and, ju- and, just, know, do, and just do time limit draws more often. You could do that also and then get the, get yeah, that gets the whole thing over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Like Danielson has a match coming out with Roderick Strong, where I think his point was he wanted to create more of an idea in fans' minds of like matches can go close to the time limit, but then still have a finish. Like he wanted to kind of play around with fans' conceptions. And again, right. doing time calls in every match would help you do that to make you realize, yes, a match can go like three minutes before the time limit, and it doesn't mean you're going to go and have a draw. Right. But other th- my other note for this match I thought was interesting is a rare like. Matt, one thing we've really lost on through the years with the Prey Zach Lenny commentary team is throughout the rest of the history of this podcast, we've always had fun with the commentary. You know, whether yep. it was the horrors of the early years of or the early shows of Corino and Garchulo, and I still have nightmares about big eighties Donnie B and uh, you know, Mark Nolte's Nolteisms, all that stuff, Gabe, of course. We haven't had it with Prey Zach. And, and Lenny, there is a rare moment here in this match that I think was like, I made I, I, I made a note. I was like, wow, it's been so long since I've made a note about the commentary. So Prezak and Lenny are talking on commentary during this match. They're selling the truth, which is that Gibson only is booked for this show and two more shows. And after that, he's done. So win, lose, or draw, he's done. He's going to be out of ring or but he already had these commitments and he's going to do them. And Lenny tries to sell, I think, like, you know, hey, winning, you know, the survival of the fist would be the cherry on top of his legacy here and stuff like that. But then, Matt, at one point in commentary, Dave Prezak goes, neither of these two can afford to sustain a loss here. Gibson is leaving in two shows. He's not – and they even mention not only is he leaving in two shows, but they go – he already has his matches signed. And they actually announce, you know, he is facing Jimmy Yang and he's facing Ronald Strong. He's saying, you know, he handpicked these two matches. So he's not getting a title shot or anything. So, like, he could really – like, never before could he afford to lose a match in the sense where he's not getting a title shot. He's only got two shows left. He knows what the matches are. Like – he could definitely afford to lose. Here. Honestly, so honestly, like, rude of him of being in the survival of the fittest at all. Because what if he won? We would just take the take, not even get to take the title shot, and no one else does either. Selfish is what I say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, next, we get a clip of Brian Danielson versus Spanky from Best of the American Super Junior Show. And speaking of people leaving, a Gabe voiceover tells us that Spanky is done in Ring of Honor with his last show being the previous one, Dragon Gate Invasion. Uh, Gabe thanks Spanky for his con- contributions to Ring of Honor. And then he says that Danielson will not be appearing tonight or the next two Ring of Honor shows because of commitments he made before he became the Ring of Honor world champion. But he will be booked on every show after that. And, of course, we mentioned on the Glory by Honor 4 show, those are this show. It's because of the TPI. And the other two shows, it's because his sister was getting married. So... It, it is. It does. Did it feel like to you that like Gabe was planning on having Spanky on at least one more show? Because usually when guys are leaving, like they acknowledge on commentary and there's like some kind of goodbye. And here it almost feels like, well, it turns out that last show was Spanky's last show. Like we didn't know, but we're going to tell you now. Yes, I, I, th- I think it was an abrupt departure. I don't think it was. Yeah. I don't think it was known in advance that he was leaving at that moment. Uh, we go backstage to Prince Nana, Jay Chung, and Jimmy Ray. As always, Nana blames Jade for a loss. He browbeats her, says if she screws up at the next show in New York, it's going to be one heck of a problem. He then tells her from now on she can't even walk around with them on her feet, and he orders her to get on her knees and walk like a dog as he holds her leash, and she does. Uh, That's par for the course. Uh, Ugh, ugh, indeed it is par for the course, (laughs) yep. We get another shot of uh, Kenta Kobashi at, at the next show backstage with a graphic telling us that he's almost here. 
Then we have a show that a match that did not make the show, but it was a result anyway. It was Devito, Devito and Shane Hagedorn defeating Derek Dempsey and Pele Primo. So this might have been like Devito's last match in Ring of Honor, but it does not make tape. But he he was on this show, strangely enough. Um, and that brings us to the Ring of Honor pure title match. Nigel McGuinness successfully defends his title when he defeated BJ Whitmer via pinfall in 14 minutes, 12 seconds, when he used a folding press while grabbing the ropes after he hit a low blow. And grabbing the ropes was legal because BJ had used all three of his rope breaks in this pure title match. So uh, before the match, Todd Sinclair explains the pure rules as usual. He gets heckled by the crowd as usual. Nigel gets on the mic and asks them to show some respect. He says he knows Boston loves the red stockings. Uh, Todd Sinclair has to tell him it's the red socks, not the red stockings. Nigel says that's a stupid name for a baseball team. Uh, Nigel boasts that he is the best pure wrestler in the world today. And for the second straight show, he lifts Bret Hart's best there is, best there was line. And he gets good, pretty good booze for it for the second straight show, too. So people really do not like p- people lifting uh, Bret Hart's stuff. Um, I thought the first half of this match was very pure in a way I enjoyed. It was uh, mostly Nigel grappling. And somewhat surprisingly, since he was the heel, kind of dominating BJ on the mat, I found. And... He was, Nigel was a little heelish in this section. Like he got BJ to quickly use up two rope breaks just by getting him in holds and then pushing him towards the ropes, which doesn't really seem fair, which I guess is kind of the point. BJ yells at the ref about it. But it also is weird because it leads to this weird inconsistency where later in the match, uh, BJ like is pushed up against the ropes and he touches the ropes with just his foot to the point where the rope shakes. And Todd Sinclair is like, nope, that doesn't count. Which is like, well, so it counts if you touch the ropes with your shoulder or your arm if you get pushed into them, but not your foot. Like, it's just one of those weird pure title things that's weird. Anyway, um, Whitmer does occasionally for, throw a forearm during this first half, but really it's mostly Whitmer being out-wrestled. The second that, uh, half of the match is like they flip a uh, switch and it's a very unpure feeling where it's more just a regular mid-card match you'd expect from these two. Bunch of hard-hitting Um there's no real use of the pure rules for the most part in the second half other than a couple key spots. There's no grappling, just a lot of strikes and throws and things. There's potential here. They could have told the story in the sense of you could have said like, oh, Nigel, when it's a, when it's a grappling, Nigel out wrestles BJ. But when it's like a hard fought, like brawling type match, BJ has the advantage. But the second half of the match, it just doesn't feel that way. It just feels like a back and forth match. And even though it's more action, it feels like it really loses momentum in the second half. Uh, it just, it just feels like everything feels off. The Ring of Honor website would r- report after this apparently that, that uh, both BJ and Nigel suffered concussions during this match. I don't know if that was them working or not. I presume it was real, and I could believe it because well, there is. A, oh, go on. Well, they both oh, worked the next the next week. And they seem, you know, they seemed okay. So I, I mean, maybe you know, I guess it was a different era. So it's still, I guess that could still be true. But I mean, there were some hard shots to the head. And I did see one spot. I forget exactly what it caused it, but Nigel was kind of shaking his head and looking a little bit logy. So maybe it's possible. I, I don't know. It just did seem like these guys weren't at their best at the second half. And so I could believe the idea that they both got rocked. And and there was also a weird spot late in the match where. BJ in late in the match just hits a top rope wrist clutch exploder and it looks great and it just gets a near fall. It was so weirdly out of place because I feel like doing the top rope version of your devastating finisher, that feels like a move you should pull out in like your biggest match when you've done hit all your biggest moves and had a bunch of near falls. And here it just came out of nowhere. And, you know, Nigel's back in control going to the finish not that long afterwards. And I felt like it was such a jarring, weird moment in this match. And, yeah, there's just something off to me about the second half. I thought overall the match was slightly above average. Um, The finish continues the Nigel heel run where, um, like, there's a rope break gets used up. I believe Nigel uses a rope break. And when the ref is turning to tell the – Bobby Cruz to announce to the crowd that, you know, a rope break has been used. Nigel hits a low blow and then he uses, holds onto the ropes during a cradle to get the win, which he can do because BJ had used all his rope breaks. So it's a, it's a cheap finish, but that's, it's, it's sudden and cheap, but that's the point, right? At this point with Nigel's character. Um, yeah, I just wasn't really feeling this, but it was not a terrible match. Um, it's funny because I think I liked the early portion of the match a little bit less than you. And I liked the later portion of the match a bit more than you. Um, 
So like, I really do like Nigel, you know, when he does the, you know, the pure stuff, I think it like, he's trying to get over a character that he's good at and he can outsmart anybody by using the rules. Um, that said, it annoys me that a year and a half after debuting the pure title, they were still doing like rule based controversies. You know, I feel like we should be away from that. You know, I mean, that's how the, it started, right? With Punk being like, is yeah. that, that that shouldn't count as a rope break, right? And they're and they're doing it now, like with Nigel pushing him into the ropes, and that's a rope break. Like, that's absurd. That like like that's what you need an authority figure for to be like, okay, <laughs> let's straighten out these pure title rules because that should not be a thing. Like, there should not be it should not be a gimmick at this point that the referees don't consistently know what those rules are. You know what I mean? It's it's just it feels cheap to me. Um, but like the later part of the match where they hit some big moves, like you might be right about the uh, the concussions and the exploder kind of not making sense. Like, cause also when BJ does hit the exploder, even though he's covered near the ropes, he kicks out. He doesn't use a rope break, and then BJ hits a drop kick, and that makes Nigel use a rope break. You know, so that's definitely weird. But I thought it was exciting enough um, that. Um, oh, another another annoying thing about the pure title rules. So because BJ had used up all his rope breaks, the referee allows Nigel to like hold the ropes while he does like a pinning combo. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Like the rope breaks are so if BJ gets the ropes, the hold doesn't break. Not so Nigel can just grab the ropes whenever he wants in a hole, right? Does I mean that that's that they never established that that was part of the rules. Am I wrong about this? I I mean the problem is they don't establish a lot of things. I think that goes to your point, which is we're yeah. like well into the pure titles existence, and it still feels like every other match there's something that causes commentary to go, should that count? Like 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 a lot of times even the commentaries are like confused, like. And I, and I feel like, yeah, it happens too often. Like, do that once in a blue moon, not like every other show. I guess it's them trying to find interesting wrinkles for the pure rules. Right. But it just comes off kind of cheap when it's always like, oh, should that count? Does that count? And you just constantly have these questions. Yeah, by this point, the pure rules shouldn't be used for interesting wrinkles. It should be used for, like, match strategy and, like, you know what I mean? Like, if they're going to do it, I mean, I guess they decided they didn't want to do it after, like, a year, less than a year <laughs> after this. But, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's too cheap um, for ROH. But um, I still thought the big spots were exciting enough. I, I agree that the match wasn't much more than above average, but, like, I think we just had a f- reversal of which part we liked more. <laughs> Which is funny, because usually you like the more map based stuff, I find, a little more than I do sometimes. Well, you and, know, and, nominally it makes sense. Um, the map based stuff, get it? <laughs> I, I completely forgot your name, Matt, and forgot how, did not then realize what a good pun that was. Thank you. Um, or just a joke. I mix it up my puns. Anyway, I'm, I'm having a stroke right now. So, uh, <laughs> Sean Radikin wrote in a what? live report. Should I call I someone, by the way, about your stroke? No, I'm okay. Should I call Jeff Sean, Jarrett? <laughs> Please do not have Jeff Jarrett give me a stroke. B- Billy Squire? Definitely have Billy Squire give me a stroke. Okay. Um, sh- sh- so Sean Radikin wrote this during the live report. And I did not notice this watching the match live, but this is delightful. Sean Radikin writes, At one point, Whitmer chopped McGinnis so hard that Nigel took the ref aside and said, Is that legal? So I thought that's very cute. Where he's like, oh, that hits too hard. And also, we should mention Lacey was again taking notes during this match, and this match would have a payoff for her taking notes. Picks the loser um, again. <laughs> yeah, that's another weird thing. So we go to the main event already: Survival of the Fittest 2005 final, a six-way elimination match. Roderick Strong defeated Austin Aries, Christopher Daniels, Colt Cabana, Jay Lethal, and Samoa Joe in 50 minutes, 30 seconds. And the eliminations went like this. Roderick Strong eliminated Samoa Joe via pinball in 1357 after Daniels hit him with the best moonsault ever and Roderick just stole the pin. Uh, Aries eliminated Christopher Daniels via pinball in 19 minutes, 12 seconds using a roll up. Roderick Strong eliminated Jay Lethal via pinball in 3123 after Aries hit a brain buster. Uh, Roderick Strong eliminated Colt Cabana via pinfall in 3551 after hitting a pile driver. And then Roderick Strong eliminated Austin Aries via submission in 50 minutes, 30 seconds when he made him tap out. I wanted to say to the stronghold, but really it was just a regular backbreaker. He didn't have his knee in his back, which is, I think is what makes the stronghold the stronghold. But yeah, so, uh, Roderick Strong becomes the second person to, uh, ever win the survival of the fittest. And he almost became one of two people 
to have every elimination in the match. He did not. He came one short. Uh, Chris Hero would later become a, the one guy to have that uh, accolade to be able to say that he was the, every elimination in a survival of the fittest match. But he comes close here. Uh, Matt, this is obviously there's a lot of eggs in this basket for this match. You know, it's it's basically one third of the show. What do you think about it? Well, I'll say this. It's a good lineup. Right, like at, for yeah. 2005 ROH, it's like star studded, right? When you have um, Lethal and Joe and Generation Next and Daniels and Cabana, like that's good stuff, right? Like that's, that's like okay, yeah. all star lineup. Um, so the thing about like these 15 minute matches, it's like again, you want it to be really fucking awesome, and it's like this, like it's like they have all this talent in there, so it's very fast paced. They keep it moving. It's entertaining. It's not dull or slow. And that's a good thing because it's very easy to make a match this long, dull or slow. But they just can't get it to that level. Like the the 2004 version of the match was a lot of fun do it during all the eliminations, and then they had this just fantastic singles match between Brian Danielson and Austin Aries. Um, this match was pretty fun during the eliminations, and then the final singles match was fine but like didn't really feel electric and you know you want some electricity and maybe it was just a difference in the atmosphere and the place that they were in but like they tried to do some different stuff here like generation next were a team like and like so a lot of the match was like different almost tag team elements so you start off really hot everyone's brawling which is different from last year lethal and joe do stereo topes onto everyone to start the match which i think is a good way to start the match and joe and lethal are a tag team like they work over cabana um and prazak says that in the early portion of the match you'll see more teamwork than when it comes down to one-on-one so i'm like wait prazak so you're telling me that when it's one-on-one the two guys don't work together (laughs) to beat each other so, you know, he's like having a rare off night. Here. Yeah. Well, you know, it's good. I mean, it's good insight. You know, when, when, the, when, the, when, it, when it comes down to one on one, you're not going to see a lot of teamwork. And um, at, at one point, it seems like Joe's trying to backdrop Cabana onto the floor, but instead Cabana crotches himself. And like, I could not tell if that was on purpose because like Joe reacted like, uh, so I almost wonder if like that was just like a mistake and Cabana just sold it really well. Um, I guess, you know, who knows? Um, but they, uh, when, when Cabana comes back in, they do a tease of the way he eliminated Joe in 2004 by doing that sunset flip with like a really like high angle roll up. But Joe kicks out this time. I thought that was cute, you know? Um, then Daniels tags it and they really work over Daniels for a pretty long time. And Daniels is selling that he's beat up after his really long match. Like he has like a bandage at the top of his head and everything. Um, and he gets worked on for a while. And finally, after Daniels whips Joe into the Generation Next corner, Aries tags himself in. He hadn't been in for like the first 10 minutes of the match. And then he goes to work on Daniels. And now Generation Next are working over Daniels as the tag team. And, you know, they, they do a pretty good job. And Daniels actually exchanges some chops with Strong. And he doesn't look foolish. So that's a win for Daniels because, you know, you would think like Strong's chops are his thing. And that's not really true for Daniels. But Daniels is in there for a long time. Um, at one point, Generation Next do a double team delayed vertical suplex, which is definitely not a move you see too often. I can't think of too many like, double team delayed vertical suplexes. So I thought that was pretty cool. So there's cool stuff throughout. Um, the, the thing that annoyed me about this se- sequence is, though, um, Daniels is beat up for a long time and finally hits like a sudden STO on Roderick out of nowhere. And he hits a bunch of his signature moves, but he doesn't tag out. And I'm like, well, this isn't this like, I mean, this was, I thought this whole thing was set up for you to hot tag somebody and you just kept doing moves. And I thought that was really weird because, you know, Daniels is this veteran. You would think that he would know that that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, But instead of tagging out, Lethal pulls him out of the ring and Strong and Roderick come in. uh, I mean, uh, Strong and Aries come in and go toe to toe. Um, Excuse me, Strong and Joe. Um, and, uh, they trade chops, Strong gets a roll up and Joe uses the tights to pull Strong into the choke and Strong makes the ropes. And then Daniels immediately comes in and hits the BME, but Roderick backbreakers him 
and the announcers say the best moonsault ever landed on Joe's arm, and that allows Strong to pin Joe, making him the first person eliminated for the second year in a row. It wasn't really so obvious to me that it landed on Joe's arm, but I guess uh, that's the story they were telling. Um, the only thing that confused me, like, I wasn't really sure if they were the legal men. I think they kind of lost the plot there about who was legal. Um, but, oh well. Um, so then it's, um, they, they go to work on Lethal. Um, they continue to, uh, to, uh, do, kind of do double team stuff, Generation Next does. Um, and then, uh, everyone is coming in as a house of fire at this point, which is a benefit of this match. Cabana comes in after a while and he's a house of fire. So he's fresh because he hadn't been in a really long time and he starts doing wacky holes and holds and going to work on Aries' neck. And then Daniels tags himself back in and then everyone is working on Aries' neck and his back. And the announcers say that everyone is working on Aries' back because of the chair shot from earlier, but Again, another time where the announcers seem to notice this more than I do, because it seems like they're attacking the neck as much as anything else. Um, but uh, Lethal gets some offense, misses the diving headbutt, uh, which allows Aries to tag out to Strong, and Daniels tags in too. And Daniels is kind of working like he got the hot tag, which made me think that he was going out soon. He hits a, a blue thunder bomb, uh, but then Aries blind tags Strong, which. Um, and Daniels, as he's going for the Angels' wings, Ares comes in and rolls up Daniels into a sunset flip and gets the win. So I was right that <laughs> Daniels was working so hot that he was like, uh, he's definitely going out soon. So now it's Cabana and Lethal against Generation Next. So interesting. Everybody in this match, I realize, is a babyface um, at this point because I'm like, oh, there are four babyfaces in here now. And then I was like, wait, there were six babyfaces in there at the beginning. So <laughs> it didn't really occur to me until this moment. Um but yeah, it still seems to me like Cabana is working on Aries' neck, not his back. But Aries is selling his back, which is weird. Um, I will say the crowd really loves it when Aries and Strong are doing this double team offense. They uh, so I will say that um, they they do it like this weird sequence where they keep trying to cover somebody, and the ref keeps going like "You're not the legal man," and like this happens a few times. And I I don't know. Did you think they were genuinely confused, or did you think this was like just part of the layout of the match? I think they were generally confused because it didn't have a payoff. Like, like at first I thought, oh, this is a story because, like, I felt like maybe it was part of the story of this match is, you know, Aries and Strong are teaming up and they don't want to face each other till the very end. And there was a couple of moments for, like, there, there was one moment like that where because of the way one guy hit someone or something, Aries and Strong, like, Todd Sinclair kept telling them, like, you guys have to face each other. And it went for, like, that way for, like, 20 seconds. And then eventually one of them just went to the apron and Todd Sinclair just gave up. And I was yeah. like, well, clearly, like, like, clearly they were not on the same page. And it was so weird because at first I thought, well, this must be part of the story. And, but then when it doesn't pay off, I'm like, well, like, yeah, it's, it's just weird. Like, I don't know what the heck it was going on. It was so weird. <laughs> yeah, you, you would think that, like... Did the like, especially someone like Aries, who you know can wear his emotions on his sleeve? You'd think he'd be pretty pissed off about this. Like he was like, like, dude, like, stop fucking up our match. Like, don't worry yeah. about the legal man so much. But um, you know, he he might have been a little bit mellower back then. Um, but um, yeah. So they it's it sort of worked like a tag match here with Cabana like actually helping Lethal get to the ropes on a Boston Crab, which you know I'm trying to decide if that makes sense, and I think I ultimately have decided that it does because. Cabana doesn't want to be left alone with Aries and Strong, yeah. so he'd rather just Lethal stay in there longer. Um, so I think it does make sense. Um, and the crowd is definitely on Lethal's side here. They start treating Generation X like the heels, um, which I guess makes sense in the sense of like somebody sort of has to work heel. And I guess Generation X, because they've been so dominant, they'll be the ones to be the heel and like Lethal has more sympathy. Um, so he tries to fight off both Generation X members. Strong hits the double knees and Aries hits the brain buster. And again, Aries goes for the cover and the ref won't count because he's not legal. And the ref makes Roderick cover and he gets three. Um, so whatever you think of that, that was a thing that happened. Um, <laughs> but um, it was an interesting sequence because they were setting up a hot tag that Lethal was never able to make. And I actually like that. Like, it kind of makes a normal tag match more meaningful because it just shows how important the hot tag is. Like, eventually, if you don't make it, you're just going to lose. I don't know if, like, you picked up on that, but they were, like, clearly, like, like lethal. They, everyone was, like, trying to uh, will lethal on to tag in Cabana, and he just never gets there. 
Um, See, uh, there, there were so many. Uh, I'll get, when, I, when I talk about this, but there were so many things in this match where I was started looking at just the, the vein of this being weird and not like this is a novel idea because, and maybe it was, but I just there was so much, in, especially in the middle part of this match, where I'm just like, there's just weirdness in this match. There's a lot of weirdness in a in a way I'll, I'll talk about later, but it just seems weird. Yeah, I, I that I agree with you about a lot of it. I appreciated that element to it. And maybe it was weird, but I think I, I think it worked for me. Um, so I, I'll just say I'll, I'll, to your point because you asked about. It, I would say I think that's almost like the thing we were talking about with with Cornette saying you got to do the time calls every match. I feel like if one guy doesn't make the hot tag, he looks like an. I, I feel like he kind of. I didn't like that as much of you because I think it makes Lethal Kyle look weak. But I feel like if you started doing that like regularly then no one looks weak. It's just like sometimes you make the hot tag, sometimes you don't. But if you become like the only guy in a year in a promotion that can't make the hot tag, you kind of look, you stick out in, in not a good way, right? Hmm, interesting, interesting way to think about that. Um, yeah, I suppose you're right. Um, I, I did like when, when it finally came down to three, Cabana wouldn't tag in. He tried to make Strong and Aries face off against each other. Um, but like, here's another weird thing. Roderick goes for a chop on Aries, so Aries ducks, and Roderick chops Cabana, and the referee counted that as a tag. Like, what? I mean, I, I mean, I know tag team matches are inconsistent in general, but, like, did that work for you? Yeah, it did, because I think the idea was Colt wants to avoid getting tagged if they try to tag to him, and so, like, the only way he was going to be tagged into the match was if he got caught off guard. But with a chop instead of just, like, a... A tag, like it was. It was clear, like he was he was chopping Aries. Like he went for a chop, and Aries ducked. But anyway, um, so now it's Aries against Cabana, and uh, Cabana. Whenever Cabana gets a hold on Aries, Strong just casually comes in to break it up, like not even with any sense of urgency. And <laughs> Cabana fights off a double team superplex, hits a big missile drop kick that definitely was not as high as his usual one, but it seems to hit Roderick closer to the legs. And he goes for his big clothesline, but Roderick gets his big kick to Cabana's arm. Um, uh, Aries is up top for the 450, but his back gives out, and he falls off the top rope, tags out to Roderick. Roderick hits another backbreaker for two, and he hits a pile driver, which I don't remember seeing too many regular pile drivers from Roderick, but I guess in a 50-minute match, you do other things. So can Um, I ask a question quickly? Yes. Um, When I watched the match live, I thought, like you just said, that it's Aries selling like that he couldn't do the 450 because of his back. A lot of people that were covering this match seem to think that was a legit botch, and that's why Strong won out of nowhere with a pile driver. Like that was an audible. Like <laughs> I, I see. At first, I thought just like you did, but then once I read other people said, now I'm questioning it. So I don't know. Like, do you th- uh, do you think that was the intention, or that Aries just really covered up botching his 450 well by immediately grabbing his back? Um. Uh- Hard to say, I suppose. I mean, I think it makes sense because they were pushing the whole back thing during the match, but maybe that was like a after the fact, like, r- uh, you know, retroactive continuity where they're like, oh, yeah, we've got to say that his back is hurt. But he did get hit with a chair to the back earlier in the show. The only thing that makes me wonder if it was a botch was just like how people point out it is very weird that Roderick Strong, like, wins out of nowhere with a pile drive, especially when, like, to do this weird sequence where Aries. <laughs> can't do a 450, his partner wins a match then with a move he never wins. And it's like, like Aries missing the 450 doesn't really lead to like any dramatic comeback. It just means for Colt, it just means that Strong has to be the guy that finishes Colt off. But why, if they called an audible, would that make him suddenly have to win with a move he never wins with? Yeah, you see that, that again, that goes back to my point, Matt. This match is just weird. It's weird. It is, it is weird. Yeah. I mean, you know, matches like this are probably going to be a little bit weird, but yeah, no, it is. Um, you know, and like to to um, to add to the weirdness, for whatever reason, they decide to stop now when it comes down <laughs> to the last two to do a promo, and like and like for some reason, like to me, like this hurts the momentum because I you know I thought the crowd was pretty into the match, like you know whatever, despite the weirdness. But like then Aries does like this nonchalant promo. He's like, "You were booing us, but you know we've done the same thing. We're going to be Generation X." And then someone in the crowd is like, "In Dorchester," and Aries, which I thought was a good comeback, was like, "Hey, buddy, you live here, not me." But it's like, it's just a weird tone to strike, right? As you're building up to the go home yeah. sequence of a what should be a hot main event, right? 
Like, yeah, like, yeah, to, to put a point on that, Aries, when he's talking, he goes, you know, th- he says the line, this is how we got where we are, like how we are today. And the fan just perfect timing. You can be heard perfectly. Then says in Dorchester and the, the crowd like laughs. at him. Like, yeah. So I, I felt like Aries, his comeback was good, but I felt like the fan actually won that one. because that, that, that fan got pretty good laughs. And again, yeah. like you're saying that's maybe not the emotional like moment you want to be having at this point in the match it, having like a fan joke get like points on you and i genuinely do think it hurt the momentum like i thought the crowd was hotter before this than they were after this like and then they built them back up but like you know like they, first of all they, they did not have the epic one-on-one match that aries and danielson had and roderick was definitely being treated as the baby face which i think is what they wanted so that's good um, but they go right to the mat. They have a standoff. Strong works some basic holds. Aries tries to fight it off with like a side headlock. They have a few more of the, the standoffs. Um, they trade clotheslines. Aries goes for a crucifix bomb, which Roderick reverses into the double knees attempt, but Aries blocks that, goes for a Boston crab on Roderick, who blocks that, and we have another one of those applause breaks. And of course, the idea here is like they know each other so well, they can block anything that the other guy is trying. Um, they brawl on the floor a bit, um, coming back in, Aries st- snaps Roderick's neck on the top rope and Air- and Roderick goes back outside and Aries, I guess, cause he hit a, hit the heat sticking missile earlier in the show. This time he, he hits a corkscrew press to the floor, which made me think, okay, I guess his back is okay enough to do that. So maybe that does add some credence to the, uh, botch theory. I don't know. Um, but Aries can't get strong up for a suplex, which is back related. So Strong turns that into a a vertical suplex into a backbreaker move, which gets a two count, and they do a lot more reversals. And Aries sells his own back after hitting the torture rack inverted Finley roll, gets a delayed cover with a two count, and they, they trade chops in the middle of the ring. Roderick hits a big boot to the face. Um hits a come some of his and then Aries hits some of his corner drop kicks, goes for the brain buster but sells the back big time afterward, and he goes up top. Roderick catches him. They fight a bit. Strong gets Aries on his shoulders, hits the gut buster off the middle rope, which the crowd, now the crowd is fully back in the match. And they're they're down. They get back up. They trade forearms. Roderick hits the half Nelson, or he goes for the half Nelson backbreaker. Aries turns that into a crucifix bomb, which I thought was a pretty cool spot. Then Aries hits the punt again, goes for the brain buster, which Roderick escapes. Hits the two half Nelson backbreakers, gets the strong hold, but then, like you said, he sits down and just do a really deep Boston Crab and Aries taps out. Um, and, you know, the crowd does pop pretty big for the win. And, like I said, um, weirdness, definitely. Too long, definitely. Kind of meandering, but it really was pretty entertaining. <laughs> like, it was, like, they, 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 it, I was very tired when I turned this match on. It was 50 minutes, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to get through this. And I did. And I, for the most part, enjoyed it, but it was, like you said, a weird match. Not good enough for its length, uh, which is something that I think you'll see a lot. But that's that's what I would say. It, if it was going to be this long, it should have been a lot better. That's what I would say. But it, but it was. I thought it was good. I, I agree it was good. You know, if I had to give it a star rating, like three and a half stars, but it, it kind of... I, I believe I used this test with the uh, Punk Daniel 60-minute draw where I have a long match test where it's like – sometimes the best review of a long match can be, do I ever want to watch this match ever again? And in both this and the Daniels Punk match, like I, I will tell you, I think both these are good matches. I enjoyed watching them the times I've watched them. But at the same time, like will I ever want to pick up this match and watch it ever again? Like, no, where something like Joe versus Punk, you know, I will want to watch that again one day. But um, I thought it's weird, Matt. Um, the, so many things in wrestling, we want them to try and make us sense because it, it's more fun if things make as much sense as they can in the weird world of pro wrestling. But I feel like there are some things in wrestling where we go um, – like this never makes sense, but we we all accept that because it's more fun that way. Like for example, how whenever two teams are having a war games match, it doesn't make sense that the heel team wins the coin toss almost every single time. But as wrestling fans, we just accept that because we know it's more fun that way. I feel like this match was full of things that make sense 
and but they were less fun. Like they were for the kind of things where these are all things I could say. Oh, I can see why you would do that, but it's making the match less entertaining. Like I think the big thing is the main story of the match being those partnerships, which is in this match of six people, you have Joe and, and Lethal working together in the first like ten minutes or so, and then you have Aries and Strong. The real story is them basically dominating the match as a partnership, and it makes complete sense. Like in in terms of just logic it makes sense if you have a partnership in a six-person match if you have one guy on your side no one else does of course you're going to have a better shot and you might just dominate and you know you look at the results every single elimination is that is that two-man partnership but i believe the way they worked it, it it made the match less entertaining and less dramatic like i feel like aries and strong were rarely in any danger Particularly in that middle point where it gets down to just Colt and Lethal and Aries and Strong and Colt and Lethal start kind of teaming up, you think, okay, that's the story is these two now have to work together to survive against Aries and Strong. But Aries and Strong dominate most of the middle of the match. Like even that point – and like you mentioned, like to the point where Jay Lethal doesn't even get to make a hot tag and I just felt like – the story they told made sense, but the story of two baby faces teaming up together and dominating everyone all the way to the end isn't like really a dramatic thing. And like you mentioned, when when Aries gets on the the mic to do that little promo before the final two wrestle, he he he's like a little bit sensitive where he's like saying, you know, I don't know why you guys were booing, and he feels the need to justify it. Where he goes like, hey, it's just smart. You do the same thing, and this is how we got to the top to begin with. Is is strength and numbers, and the fans kind of cheer at that point. But they were getting boos during the match, and I don't think that's probably what Gabe would have wanted, seeing how they're both baby faces. They're in the middle of a big feud against a heel faction and you know this is all serving to try and make strong like another big pushed up the card fan favorite and the crowd kind of boos them at points when they're doing so successfully dominating this match because while it makes sense for them to dominate the match things can make sense but not be heroic like it's smart to double team everyone else in the match but it's not heroic you know like if someone said to me trevor I'll pay you $500 to win a race, a foot race, and you can have your choice. You can either have a foot race against people of your own age or you against a bunch of five-year-olds. It is smart for me to pick the five-year-olds. It is not heroic of me. No one's going to be cheering me on when I beat the five-year-olds to win the $500. I, 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 I would be. <laughs> well, you're biased, man. Unless I mean, I you don't know many five year olds, I assume. So, like, you, you, know, you have a clear dog in this fight, and it's me. Plenty, of, I have plenty of friends that have kids around that age. <laughs> yeah, but they all suck. You mm. don't do a podcast with any of them, do you? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> For the years, babies. <laughs> secret. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a funny thought. Um, anyway, point is, I'm rooting you on to beat those kids. <laughs> <laughs> beat those kids. Your T-shirt. Anyway, um, so it, it's stuff like that. And then there's also another part of it that's not like uh, I feel like both the Joe injury and the uh, the Aries back injury and the Joe arm in- injury. I really like the, the idea of taking injuries happen in the first round of a tournament and paying them off in the later rounds. But what I felt like both guys and, and I think you kind of probably felt the way, too, I could tell from the way you're talking about it, like. They, especially Joe, like they only sold those injuries like late in the match when it was like, okay, now it's story time. Cause there was, there were like, there was parts of this match where I forgot er- that Joe had an injured arm from the Milano match. And I forgot until, you know, the second half of the match that Aries had an injured back from the, the end of the rave match. But it's only now, like, they, they, they only sold them, I felt like, when it was time to tell a story involving them. There's a reason that in wrestling they do things like bandage a body part. It gets over the injury a lot more. So yeah. like it's you just it's too easy to ignore it most of the time. So like that's why you put on like you tape up the back or the arm or something. That would make it just a little bit more uh, consistent. And then the final negative and, and uh, that's a great point. And maybe that would even remind the wrestlers I should tell this a bit more. But uh, I, I think the final negative of this match, and I did enjoy this match, but I think the, the negatives are the more interesting part here, is – and it's comparing this to the first survival of the fittest. We both liked the first survival of this quite a bit, and I, I feel like it, the the body of the match until it got to the final two of the first survival of the fittest was good, but a lot of, it wasn't like that much better 
than this match in terms of match quality. I think the fun was the booking was really good, how it set up a bunch of feuds going forwards. And, really and like it was that. and it really really kept it moving, and there was a lot of personality. I thought in that first one, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then what really sent that match over the top was Danielson and Aries then basically had like an entire like 20 plus minute match. I think a few minutes over 20 minutes that was really, really great and a legit, as, as Aries keeps saying, he's right. It was a star making kind of breakout performance for him. I feel like this match, it could have, the body of the match was good enough that these two had a similar kind of, and clearly they were trying to shoot for that, like a star making match for Roderick Strong and it doesn't come close. I think it's my favorite part of the match, but it's only like a little bit better in my opinion than the body of the match. And part of that is I feel like in the first survival of the fittest, Aries and Danielson were just like, let's just like reset. We're just going to have a great match from the ground up. These guys, I felt like they were kind of selling the fatigue and selling Aries injury. And it was a lot slower paced and a lot more labored. And again, it makes great sense that you would work they worked this like this was the end the last 10 minutes of a 50 minute match rather than like an extra special bonus match but again it's one of those things that makes sense but it's not as entertaining as if they just kind of forgot everything and went nuts and went fast and, and you know and but yet despite all of this there is fun i liked the booking like you mentioned how for the second straight year joe was the first elimination i like how the injuries played into things i liked how at the very end, you know, where it's just Aries and Strong, I liked how they were counting each other's stuff because they knew it so well. I liked how Aries early on in that final stretch went for thing moves that he couldn't do because his back hurt so much. But at the very end of the match, he hit some of them. Like he powered through. I like that kind of progression. It makes them – when he does hit those moves more dramatic. It was never boring at any point during the match. But, you know, I feel like if the goal of this match was to make Strong – a, a new top star in one night like Aries, it didn't work. And if the goal was for this to be just an amazing DVD selling match that kind of saves an, a so-so show with a on paper not particularly enticing lineup, it wasn't quite at that level either. You know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say you know, they wouldn't have done this because you know Joe had the big Kobashi match coming up. But like while I totally understand why they would go down to Strong and Aries. I think Strong versus Joe with Strong getting the win would have been that much more dramatic. I don't know if, if that makes sense to you. I, I, I agree. And do, do you think it was a mistake having arguably the two most over guys be the first two eliminations? Like, do you think it was bad that they got Joe and Daniels out of the way first? Because a, a note I didn't read from Sean Radican, he was noting, and it's something I've noticed too on his comeback, that Christopher Daniels is probably like the most over guy in Ring of Honor on, in some respects on this point. Like, it's shocking. Like, I think some of the booze Aries and Strong get during this match are like when they're going after Daniels. Like Daniels was really beloved. I think at this point in his comeback, I think it's conditional. Like Daniels gets huge pops for his entrance, and the people are so excited to see him. His matches do not get as over as a lot of other guys. Is what I would say. Yeah, I I would agree there. Um, And there were some cool spots like that double dive to start. You mentioned Joe and Lethal do. I can only describe as like a spike gourd buster, which was cool. We get to see more of those hard chops that uh, Jay Lethal did in the opening match you uh, you referenced. Um, you know, I, I like that kind of stuff, but it's just uh, a Colt screams it's clobbering time as a tribute to Punk. That was uh, cute. Um, and, and oh, there was an also cute, but also goes to your thing of maybe Aries being a little bit too funny for a serious big match. There's a point where Ar- when Aries puts Lethal in the Boston Crab, you can hear him talking to Roderick Strong. He's saying, like this? Am I doing it right? I'm not sure. Like, like he's getting coaching for, about yeah. how to do I like the idea that Austin Aries doesn't know how to do a Boston Crab at this point in his career. <laughs> like, I, I think that's pretty funny. Um, it's well, he could do an Austin Crab. <laughs> Your pun game is on point today, mm. my friend. Um, so, and, and not to always, it, people are allowed to have different opinions, but my last note from Sean Radican, I thought this probably tells you, like, this is a great illustration of how live wrestling can be a lot better than watching on tape. Because Sean Radican wrote something I don't think anyone else has ever thought, which is the main event deserves match of the year consideration. I don't think this is close. No, to a match of consideration. no, but yeah, no, it's true. There are there are matches that could really come off amazingly well live, and just you watch it back and you're like, oh, this 
well, that would definitely colored my thoughts about it. Um, occasionally, you will actually have matches that are better on tape, but not not usually. <laughs> There was that that show I've always referenced. I should pro- I probably referenced it here on before, but I just love this little thing where it was the WrestleMania I think where Sting wrestled Triple H and Dave Meltzer was there live and he gave it this great report. Like this, he was super high on everything, and a lot of people were like, "Are you crazy?" And then Dave went home and watched it on tape before he wrote his review in the Observer. He was like, "Yeah, I I got caught up in being there live," and, and yeah, that can happen to anybody. Like how how could it not be better? live you know unless you're having like a real uncomfortable experience in like seating or yeah, something yeah there are there like, are said, not more fun yeah i will say there are certain circumstances where you're sitting near really annoying people and then you watch it back and you don't hear those annoying people and you're like oh this comes off much better um uh, uh one match that i could think of off the top of my head where i had that experience was um uh brian danielson against nigel mcginnis from the um i think it was the roh sixth anniversary show in 2008 which is just a freaking amazing match. And I did not have as good of a time watching it live because of partially because of some of the people I was sitting near. Oh, that sucks. Did you ever have the opposite? Like, did you ever have a me- one of these experiences where you have a match where you go, man, like you're telling people probably me at the time on instant messenger, like this is an amazing match. And then when it came out on tape, no one else felt that way. Like, did you ever feel like you got caught up in, in the emotion live? Oh yeah. I would say w- that's more common for sure. I, um, I, um, you know, usually I'm pretty measured. Like I'm not, I'm going to be like, well, that match was amazing, but you know, we'll see how it plays on tape. But yeah. like, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've never had an experience where I thought a match was great in person. And then I watched it on tape and I was like, oh, this isn't really that good at all. But I've definitely had matches where they were not as good. I actually, the Joe versus Kobashi, which we're going to review next. I was worried that that would not come off as well. Cause I was just like, man, that, that atmosphere was just freaking magical. And somehow, the atmosphere translated to the DVD. I think I even remember you telling me you were worried about that. And then I yeah. think I remember watching it. And I think I'd probably message you and be like, don't worry. Like, yeah. as soon as I saw it, I was like, holy shit. Yeah, like, this translates. Yeah, it's crazy. But anyway, we'll, we'll talk plenty about yeah. that. So, yeah, um, I, I, I should also just say, I was going to mention, I like how Gabe often plays both sides of that coin in this era of Ring of Honor. Because sometimes on commentary, he would go like, if you're watching this on DVD, it's nothing like seeing it live. You've got to see it live. But then a lot of times when he was promoting a match to buy, buy the DVD, he'd be like, this is the kind of match you really can only appreciate if you watch it on DVD two or three yeah, times. Yeah, we watch like, it seven times and notice a different thing each time, yeah. So so it was always whichever end of it he was trying to promote. It was either like you're missing out if you're not seeing these shows live or really you can only appreciate this if you're you know sipping a brandy and watching this four times in a row at home. Like, hey, a promoter is a promoter is a promoter, right? Exactly. I mean yeah. I appreciate it in that sense. I mean you, you, got, you can't knock that kind of hustle so to speak. But uh, af- after the match, uh, Roddy grabs the mic. He apologizes for being out of breath. He calls this the hardest fought match of his life. He hopes now people know the Matt Hardy win wasn't a fluke, which again must have been a bullet point Gabe told him to hit to keep hitting because he says that in his first promo on the show and here, uh, all the greatest mat all the great matches he's had this year weren't a fluke. 2005, 2006, 2007, and so on are all going to be his years. Strong says he and Aries will always be friends, and he couldn't choose a better tag partner. They hug. Aries raises Strong's hand. Strong lays out a challenge for Brian Danielson, October 29th. And he tries out a new catchphrase where he goes, only the Strong survive, which honestly, not a bad catchphrase. Um, no, I guess maybe he decided it was just too much of a cliche and he wanted to come up with something more original, which he did not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah, I would say this was better than nothing. Which yes. he went back to. <laughs> but it was um, interesting that they gave him promo time because even after this, he does not get much of that. Yeah. Uh, I, I we mentioned this before, but I will say I do appreciate that they did this whole thing and they never once teased dissension. And in fact, these two would work very closely together for a while to great yeah, success. Yeah. I, I agree. Uh, you know, I agree. Yeah, I feel like again going again. I guess the theme of the show is do certain things a lot so that when you do it the other way, it has a payoff. Like. I am so tired of every time a wrestling partners face each other, it is always linked to a breakup or a dissension angle. I, 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 and I feel like those would have more paths if more often people did stuff like this where two friends and partners fight and one wins and they're like completely cool with it. You know, right? Like back, I, I back in the old that. days when they would do the promos for the Royal Rumble and the tag team partners would be like, if it comes down to me and you, you know, and like even in that Royal, one Royal Rumble where Axe and Smash wrestled each other for like two minutes and then they're like, yeah, we're cool. Yeah. 
Like, like it's, I, I, and it's also, it's a strange level of maturity where Russ was like, I understand we had to fight each other. Like we did what we had to do. You know, it came down to us. You know, we were the only two guys in the ring for the rumble. You had to throw me out. Like, I'm okay with that. Like, yep. it's a strange, you don't see a lot of emotional maturity in pro wrestling that no. we saw a glimpse of it here, but uh, finally, we see Kenta Kabashi backstage one more time as he's shown cutting a promo in Japanese as a text scroll promotes Joe versus Kobashi. And that brings us to the end of Survival of the Fittest 2005. Uh, Matt, what do you think about the show? I mean, it's very much a B show, I would say, but there are different levels of B show. What do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, from a wrestling standpoint, this was far from the worst show of the year. Like, it's like the wrestling was was good. Like up and down like there were some good matches there was entertaining stuff nothing great um but it was kind of unmemorable and dull like it wasn't like anything you nothing on this show was something you were like yeah i want to i want to check that out again like yeah. it was just very forgettable um really i mean it's sandwiched between two really really important shows really major historic shows and you know sometimes that happens in a situation like that but yeah. still it was, you know, you know, just like an extremely B show. Um, but, you know, like I said, this was it was not a bad show to watch. The wrestling was pretty good. So overall, it was all right. But, you know, just super forgettable. I, I completely agree. This is not the worst show we've seen this year. And, you know, I don't think we've seen a bad show from Ring of Honor this year. But I wouldn't say even among the B shows in terms of wrestling quality. It, it, it's not the there's lots of good matches up and down the card, but there's nothing that you should go out of your way to see. And yeah, it doesn't, there's nothing that feels that historical. Like it's this, obviously the survival of the fittest this year, the final is not as significant to strong's career as the last one is to Aries. I will say in a weird way, this is a show that feels like it could have been more significant. Like I think at the time I would have felt like this was a bigger show in the sense of if Jarrell Clark and Milano El Clutch and AT go on to like big runs in Ring of Honor, which at this point, if I had been at the show live, I would have come away thinking that they had potential to do that. I would have felt like, hey, this is a show where, you know, a few guys really kind of started to debut and break through and all that. But then you kind of watching it in 2021, we know those guys don't go anywhere here with Ring of Honor. So that kind of takes away a shred of significance the show could have had doesn't even exist now. But that brings us to the end of the show. So for plugs, if you want to contact us through the years at gmail.com, T-H-R-O-H. Um, it, in particular, you know, if you have anything about Joe versus Kobashi, like any articles or, or news bits about it that we you think we might have might miss, we'd love to have them because that's going to be a big show. Uh, Twitter at Trevor Dame on Twitter is me uh, at Mayor MGF for Matt is him. We have a thread on the pro wrestling only dot com plugs forum. And uh, yeah, next time we are going to be covering it'll be episode 80. One of the biggest shows we will probably ever cover on through the years. One of those shows I thought of when you asked me to do the show. I can't believe we're here. Joe versus Kobashi. Let's go. Yeah. One of the biggest matches in Ring of Honor history, I believe. Probably the biggest DVD seller in game history. I know they said the time when it came out it was. I can't imagine anything eclipsed it. Maybe something did. Um, we'll see if it one of the most up. well, let's say that, one of the most historical matches of the past twenty years. And you were there, so you will have the live perspective as usual. And yeah, I mean, there's other things on the show, but for, I mean, who gives a shit? It's Joe versus Kobashi. It'll be a crazy thing to revisit. One of the most famous matches in the entire. Gabe Zabalski, early years of Ring of Honor era. And that will we we will cover that next time on Through the Years. So until next time, have a good time. Have a great time.